Koto Katoa, good morning everyone. Could I invite uh, Councillor James Daniels to open the meeting? Uh, kia ora tato, uh, kei te mihi uh, mō te, uh, kei te karakia mō te hui tuatahi o te, te tauhau. Uh, no mai, haere mai ki, ki tōku uh, whanaunga o te council. Uh, no mai, haere mai ki te manuhiri uh, o te rā. Nō reira, uh, Tūtaua mai i runga, tūtaua mai i raro, tūtaua mai i roto, tūtaua mai i waho. Kia tau mai te Māori tū, te Māori ora ki te katoa. Uh, Haumia, hui e tai ki e. Kia ora. Kia ora and thank you. Um, I have apologies from uh, Council James Goff for lateness uh, and uh, I have an apology from Sam MacDonald uh, and uh, we note that uh, Councillor Tim Scandrett is uh, joining the meeting uh, by way of uh, technology, Zoom. So uh, would someone like to move that the apologies be accepted? Uh, Aaron Kewan, seconded by Melanie Coker. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Uh, declarations of interest. Uh, we have... Um, uh, the Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Goff and Councillor Templeton um, on public excluded item 12, Christchurch City Holdings, draft letter of expectations, uh, and also um, Councillors Johansson and Major for the um, Otatahi uh, community, oh, um, sorry, uh, for the item number eight. Hearings panel report to the council on the draft community housing strategy. Um, so I've acknowledged those. If there are any other items that come up that councillors feel they have a declaration of interest to make, they should make those. I'll move on to item number three, public participation. Um, and I'll start with the public forum and invite Extinction Rebellion Autotahi uh, to present uh, to the council. Thank you. Tina Koto, Coursera Campbell, Tina. I speak on behalf of Extinction Rebellion or Tatahi. Council, Government, and Extinction Rebellion all agree we are in a climate emergency. Our airport company is telling us we need a new airport to accommodate greater demand. This is ecocide. It is also a huge financial risk to ratepayers in a time of global uncertainty. We, the people of Christchurch, are the major shareholders of Christchurch Airport. You are our voice. However, it feels like you are not listening to us. The shareholders' expectations of its CCTO, the Statement of Expectation, should be held in full view of the public. How are we to hold each of you accountable? if there is no visibility of the discussion and how you vote. Today, just as they did last year, Queenstown Lakes District Council will vote on their draft expectations to Queenstown Airport. They will vote in public where everyone is accountable. They did not hide behind the words commercial activities. This is democracy in action. In previous years, you have excluded the public from SOE Statement of Expectation deliberations. Stop choosing to put the airport executive's commercial interests ahead of the interests of the people. Stop choosing to hold decisions behind closed doors and closed meetings and without public scrutiny. Stop excluding the people you are meant to represent. We ask you to vote against Terrace Airport. 
We have shortened our speech today, knowing that we have some time remaining. We respectfully request 30 seconds of silence while we grieve the loss of democracy and transparency within this council. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda are deputations by appointment. Uh, we have no deputations by appointment scheduled and no presentation of uh, petitions. Move to the um, next item, which is to con confirm the council minutes from the 10th of December 2020. Would someone like to move that? Uh, Mike Davidson seconded Andrew Turner. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Uh, the next is the Regulatory Performance Committee minutes from the 2nd of December. Could I invite you, Councillor Scandrit, from afar to uh, perhaps give a quick presentation on the introduction of the minutes? Uh, thank you, uh, Ben. Well, it's, I'll take it as read. It's a, a standard that we do each year, it's a requirement, and um, I'll take any questions, although I can't really see that there would be any, but I'm more than happy to take some. Thanks. Uh, Pauline. Oh, thanks, Tim, and welcome from afar. Um, I've got a question Thank you. about the discussion that you held about the capacity within the animal management team to administer <coughs> the Dog Control Act Section 10A policy and practices. Yep. Um, what was the result of that discussion? It was, it was obviously relating to resourcing, did, did we end up that we do have enough resourcing or we don't have enough resourcing? I think you're up there. There is enough resourcing, but it, but like the rest of the unit, and when we mentioned um, with regards to right across the board with um, um, RMAs, etc., that they are under pressure, but um, they are well and truly managing very well. Okay, thank you. And Yanni, did you have a question on this one? Yeah, I was just wanting to ensure that um, prior to the 10th anniversary of the February earthquake that we do get that list of the earthquake prone priority buildings. So I just wanted to um, ensure that we could have that information. Yeah, uh, I'll just ask um, staff, Leonie Bay. Yeah, Yanni. Um, yes, yeah, so um, uh, yes, we will have that list. It will be provided. Uh, it's very difficult to get the information off the NB website. We download it. So we upload it through a spreadsheet. We don't hold the database. Uh, MB um, control the database, but we will have that list. If you go to the MB website, um, you can actually um, see a spatial view of where all the earthquake prone buildings are in Christchurch, but it doesn't filter down to the seven and a half or the 15 year, but they will show you where they all are and all the addresses. So there's a lot of information there. Um, okay. But yes, we will be presenting that um, next week on the 5th of February. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tim, would you like to move? Uh, is he allowed to move from afar? Yes. yes. Uh, Tim, would you like to move that the minutes be accepted? Yes, I'll move that. Seconded by Aaron Kewan. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Move on. Uh, move back to item um, six, uh, Naval Point, Te Nukul, Nukul, Nukul Tai. Um, or Tapua development plan. Uh, can I invite uh, Councillor Turner to present this on behalf of the Banks Peninsula Community Board? Thank you very much. So um, this was discussed and um, much of the matters in this report were actually decided upon under delegation um, by the Community Board um, at the Community Board meeting. 
Um, there's been a lot of work done by staff, and I would certainly acknowledge Christine Bowe and her team for the huge amount of work that's been done um, over quite a long period of time, um, working with a large number of stakeholders at Naval Point, um, including the Coast Guard, including the Naval Point Club, and a number of other um, stakeholders. Um, there were a number of deputations to the community board meeting and um, a number of matters raised in those deputations that were discussed at the community board all in relation to the Naval Point development plan um, and the decisions by the community board that you see in this report um, were made um, largely with the support of those stakeholders. We actually got to a position of, content of um, consensus um, where there certainly had been some contention around some of these issues in previous weeks and months. So certainly that was um, an achievement um, at that community board meeting, um, which was well received by the stakeholders. So the important thing to note is that the community board um, has got delegation for the approval of the Naval Point Development Plan. Um, that approval and the authority to conclude the leases with partners is contained in the Part C resolutions in this report. So the substantive matter for Council to consider today, and in fact the only substantive matter for Council to consider as regards this report um, for Council to consider today, um, is matters relating to the closure of the Magazine Bay Marina. So these matters are detailed in paragraphs 5.15 to 5.22 of the report that's in front of us. Um, the Magazine Bay Marina was constructed in the 1980s by the then Littleton Harbour Board. Um, and there was a plan to create a more extensive marina to be protected by a floating breakwater, a continuous floating breakwater um, that was initiated in the 1990s. So the breakwater protection was in the process of being strengthened when it and in fact part of the marina um, and a number of vessels that were moored in the marina at the time were destroyed in a major storm in October 2000. Um, so that resulted in damage to the floating breakwater, loss of part of the marina structure, and the loss of a, a number of vessels that were moored there. Um, the marina remained in its damaged state. There were a number of proposals that were um, put forward but not progressed in the meantime. Um, the marina remained in its damaged state. And then the next action was when Littleton Port Company in 2018 um, constructed the Tayana Marina, um, which has certainly worked and has been an additional asset both to the port and to the community and to the users of that marina. So that leaves us now in a position where, as part of the Naval Point Development Plan, there is a need to resolve issues pertaining to the um, Magazine Bay Marina, there are seven remaining berth holders there, um, and there's detail in the resolution and in the report as to how the licenses that they hold can be dealt with in order to um, bring those licenses to an end, either naturally or under the terms of the licenses or by negotiation. Um, that then will allow the um, remains of the marina to be dealt with according to the provisions in the development plan, the proposals in the development plan, which is to retain a small part of the marina and essentially to tidy up the area so that it will have a use and a role as part of the overall naval development plan. But the key point for us today is that the development plan resolutions themselves have already been approved by the community board under delegation. The matter for us to deal with is just this matter relating to the um, Naval Point, the Magazine Bay Marina. Thank you. Um, Tim has a question. Yeah, um, my understanding was that we, when we were looking at this, we were looking at a, um, a cut down version because the complete version is actually about $27 million. So I was wondering how this will affect that. The Magazine Bay Marina, um, we're only dealing with the Magazine Bay Marina. Okay. Thank oh. you. The other matters are it's, it's just... way of delegation to the community board. Is that right? Yep. Yep. I mean, I don't know whether there is an answer from staff as to um, the, the answer in, in relation to the question that Tim's asked. I mean, this, my understanding is that this is um, contained within the budget for the first phase of the marina, of the um, Naval Point development. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my concern is that if, if 
we don't put a piece of a set of fees aside for pieces of this development, we won't have a, a, head a, a view of how much we're actually spending on this project, these bits and pieces, because we've got the, the GP, so we got the sailing event, which we've got to um, have some of that area sorted for that. There are going to be pieces here. We, I thought we had agreed that we will do a cut down version of the overall plan to make it safe or whatever it was, but it just seems that we're doing bits and pieces. Where's the overall plan for the amount of money that we're spending? Bits and pieces. I'm, I'm just, I'm almost tempted to ask if we could take this matter offline because it's to do with the general project rather than yeah. a specific issue that we've been asked to approve, which is the closure of the Magazine Bay Marina once the existing licence ex expire or terminated in accordance with their licence terms and conditions. And I'm wondering if whether we could just um, have that resolution resolved um, and then uh, perhaps get an update, a briefing note from staff, just as to an update around the overall project and the decision that the community board made. Would that be, would that work? I mean, people were here to, were here prepared to discuss questions around the closure of the Magazine Bay Marina. So it, would that be okay, Tim, if, if we did that? Yep. 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 Okay. Is there any other questions? Um, Andrew, you'd like to move yes, it. Please. Seconded by Pauline. Is there any debate? I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. No. Thank you. Your, um, re your opposition is noted. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the hearings panel report to the Council on the Draft Community Housing Strategy. It says 2020 to 2030, yeah. but I think we're going to hear that um, because we're in 2021, we're going to change the dates. Yes. Um, I'd like to hand over to um, uh, Councillor Galloway, who chaired the hearings panel. Thank you for that. Uh, kia ora and thank you. Um, it's my pleasure as chair of the hearings panel with support from my fellow panel members, Councillor Mel Coker and uh, Community Board Chair Alexandra Davids, to uh, report on the outcomes of the hearing process and the submissions received to the Council for a decision on the final form and adoption of the draft community housing strategy 2021 to 2031. Council is reviewing its existing social housing strategy from 2007 because Council needs to identify the strategic roles and actions it can take to ensure sufficient social housing uh, that is, provi is provided in Christchurch. The proposal in this draft strategy is to reframe social housing as community housing, linking and embedding it into a housing spectrum approach and to, remain the to rename the strategy as a community housing strategy. The definition of community housing can be seen, can be read in point 3.3 uh, um, of the report. To genuinely achieve improvement in both quality and quantity of community, and to achieve this, the council needs to consider the current constraints of funding and the, fu and the financing options. The draft strategy was widely consulted on uh, through media, through community groups, and uh, many were engaged with. The draft strategy was presented at several forums for um, housing providers and other stakeholders. 23 submissions were received, eight from organisations, four from community boards, 11 from individuals, and six oral submissions were heard. And those uh, points that were made in those submissions can, uh, outlined in section six of the report. There was strong, very strong support for the strategy, positive comments on its conception, framework and direction were uh, recorded. One was in opposition and that did not, uh, and that person did not believe that council should be involved in any way in, in the provision of social housing. As a result of what the panel heard and read and our subsequent deliberations, changes were made to the original draft um, and these can be seen uh, through the tracked changes uh, attached to this document. 
uh, and the key issues that were addressed by the hearings panel can also be seen in section 7 of the report. So I'd like to express my thanks and gratitude to the enormous work that staff have done um, to present the strategy to us, but also to the community groups and individuals who took the time and are passionate uh, about the provision of community housing in our city. And I would request that the Council accept the recommendations of the hearings panel and adopts the housing strategy 2021 to 31. Um, I would like to invite staff to the table to answer any questions that councillors may have. Thank you. Um, could I ask councillors if they got any questions? Um, Jimmy Chen. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, staff. And the hearing panel done a great job presented to us those comprehensive reports. But I have uh, two questions. The first one, particularly regarding to the whether the hearing panel, you know, particular focus our draft uh, the the uh, social community housing strategy consider uh, those uh, uh, the uh, diversified community and uh, because except uh, the elderly and disabled, you know, uh, also quite church is a multi ethnic multicultural community. Whether one whether any the uh, the twenty three submission have any the from the uh, different ethic or the uh, culture background to make submission because, uh, because my particular concern uh, some of the people they would like to you know, build up the uh, community social housing they can group uh, together you know, particular consider their way of life or they can uh, easy to uh, communication you know, and support one another I'm not sure whether you talk about this issue or not okay um, Thank you, um, Ms. Mayor. Um, I guess uh, at two levels. I mean, firstly, we uh, canvassed as far and wide as we possibly could in terms of our general um, stakeholder, community group, interest group lists, and so on and so forth. So we sought to make them all aware of, of what we were doing, certainly at the consultation stage. And certainly at the engagement stage, we worked uh, quite heavily and quite closely with the community housing provider sector who are very representative and take into account um, diverse needs um, very strongly through the um, Te Waipunamunu Community Housing Providers Network. So, um, and who several of those members submitted um, on the strategy itself. And I suppose at um, Ms Mayor, at a, um, certainly at a very strategic level, a conceptual level, we talk strongly about a housing adequacy mm. approach to community housing. And some of the key things around there are being culturally appropriate, for example. Um, in terms of access to community housing. So whilst we didn't specifically get um, perhaps one or two of the groups you were thinking about, Councillor uh, Chen, uh, we did make efforts and we have sought to um, reflect um, those notions through the strategy's thinking. Okay, thank you. Sorry, second question. Yes, please. Uh, regarding to the uh, assessment here, the implementation plan, uh, thank you, that's a very good detail. But I am uh, consider concerned that particular focus on the action and the measurement. This one probably we, we need to have uh, some uh, uh, the, uh, supporting the, uh, the funding to support for the implementation. But uh, this uh, particular social community housing is a uh, uh, rates, a uh, neutrality. So I'm not sure where the funding come from, you know, can support uh, this implementation plan. Um, those are challenges for Council. I mean, the, the strategy attempts to lay out the challenges in um, front of Council and chart a way forward in terms of a more broader thinking about community housing, how it integrates with the rest of the community. And we note in there that ultimately those are decisions for Council through its long-term plan. Uh, the strategy, I uh, guess, seeks in the section under our roles will need to consider its ability and willingness to resource that. We note several um, actions and measures in the implementation plan about talking about a, um, the, a well-being assessment if Council wants to invest within our urban regeneration sort of thinking um, around social and economic impacts. So I guess the strategy is um, allowing Council to do that if it so wishes. So I guess that's a departure from some of the past thinking. So if Council wishes to um, invest more strongly, then this, this is just the strategy charts some direction for that. Could, could I invite the Chief Executive just to say a few words on that? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor Chan, I think it's also important 
to realise you will need to have a proper policy debate. Uh, you have a clear policy at this time in terms of what you will and will not do in relation to housing, and this strategy would need to be debated within that context. So clearly that will be something that you will be looking at in this coming year, uh, not at this point in time, because obviously we will be publishing the LTP in three weeks' time. The, the draft LTP. The draft LTP. And, and we've also um, got a number of the, our partners, you know, well, obviously um, CCHL, but also um, OCHT working very hard on what the different models are that could in fact enable um, uh, the, um, the, the outcome, but not impact on the rates um, required from our ratepayers. So, which would be... But that's a bigger piece of work and taking that will take quite some time to work through. And that's outside the, 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 the LTP process. Yep. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Ben, would you like to move? Yes, but before we do, we need to add um, a fourth uh, recommendation because we need to ch uh, amend the dates of the community. No, no. It's Is it done? Adopts the community housing oh, sorry, strategy. It's done. Helpfully Great. titled 2021 to 2031. Perfect. Sorry, I didn't, didn't realise it oh, had been So done. you would like Great. to move that? I would love to move it. Thank you. And Sarah, you would like to second it? So um, I'll open it up for debate. Uh, Andrew? Thank you very much. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the um, good work of the hearings panel um, led by um, Chair Anne Galloway. Community housing is an important aspect of Council's work, um, ensuring that there's fit for purpose, warm, dry housing um, for everyone that needs it so that housing is available affordably um, to those that need it most. So I applaud the um, focus on what we might broadly call the housing continuum, so not only focusing on assisted rental housing, but also on affordable home ownership and how an individual might make a, a transition um, from um, community housing into affordable housing and then quite possibly into market housing. Um, paragraph 3.5 of the report sets out clearly um, really what the, the big tension is here. Um, the ability to provide the quantity and the quality of um, community housing required and, in fact, affordable housing required at a time of increased need, and COVID has certainly played into that, along with a number of other matters particularly related to the housing market, but also at, at a time of, of constrained funding on the part of council and a legislative, a legislative need to be upgrading the rental properties in terms of heating and ventilation, arguably something that we should be doing anyway, regardless of the, the need from a legislative point of view. So Council um, definitely has a role to play in the provision of housing, but again, the point is well made in this piece of work that Council cannot and arguably should not do that on its own. It can do that best in partnership with others, not only the Otatahi Community Housing Trust, but also with um, partnerships with other housing providers across the city. Um, so this is certainly a good piece of work. It's a, a big step in the right direction. I welcome the discussion that Councillor Chen raised and the Chief Executive responded to um, around the, the funding parameters for social housing. That certainly will require us to have a look at the income projections from the head lease to the Otatahi Community Housing Trust. Inevitably will um, involve some discussion about whether um, rates could correctly be used to support the um, social housing portfolio on either a temporary or more permanent basis, or whether the current arrangements um, with a good look at financial prudence are actually sufficient to deliver the quality and quantity required. I welcome that discussion, but for today, um, I applaud this piece of work and um, I'm very, very happy with the way it's been carried out. Thank you. Any others? Um, Jimmy Chen? Thank you. Yeah, yeah I support uh, this uh, uh, the, uh, new revised uh, the, uh, the council, uh, the committee, uh, social housing strategy, because uh, we review the pure waste one was uh, published in 2007, so it has been uh, for almost uh, 14 years. But over the last uh, 14 years, uh, council and also city of Kaichi, we passed through uh, so many uh, disasters, the earthquake one, and uh, Paul Hill, the, the bush, the, the fire, 
and also the those most attack in 2019 and uh, also the the those the COVID-19 the pandemic you know that's quite quite the, the a lot the the disasters and quite a few people even now you know the rental fees increase a lot and some of people showed of this uh, the housing to to stay you know for the accommodation so council take a lead to face the, this the situation you know, and integrate all those the, the key the, uh, the housing provider that's, uh, actually, that's uh, fantastic particularly we are not only the, for this the new revised uh, strategy but also the for uh, implementation plan but we still need to face you know the real situation because at the moment let's read the, the neutrality regarding to the, the policy we know we need to face the, this new situation, how to break and through, can provide sufficient resources and funding to make the, this strategy the more practical, implementable. This we need to know uh, how the, 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 the common goal and also how the, 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 the lessons so we need to face this year. So I fully support this strategy. Thank you. Ian Galloway. Thank you. Uh, I think we're all aware of uh, the enormous challenges that we face in, in New Zealand uh, in terms of housing, and uh, we have in Christchurch a waiting list of around 10,000 people waiting. It's only going to get worse, and our children and our grandchildren are going to be confronted by the uh, housing issues that we have not had to, to worry about. So I hope that as a council, we can think about the future, we can think about the vision that's here, uh, that community housing is foundation, a foundation of housing in Otoutahi Christchurch for our, all of our well-being, and start putting our, our minds to how we're going to address that challenge going forward. And I look forward to um, understanding the work that uh, the Housing Trust and CCHL are doing around options for funding going forward, because that is going to be the key, how we're going to resource the need that we're going to have. So um, thank you again for um, the work that's been done. We appreciate it, our community appreciates it, and um, I look forward to your support here. Thank you. I'll um, put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed aye. say no. That's carried. Abstention. Well, we've noted the conflicts of interest, so the, there is no voting uh, from either Yanni Johansson or Phil Major as they're members of the OCHT um, board. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the next item is the Innovating, Innovating Street Cycle Connection Project, Ferry Road, Sanassif Street to Fitzgerald Ave. Um, we've just asked uh, to give a little bit of context to the background to this paper. Um, um, obviously the Innovating Streets um, project is an enabler, but the, there is more purpose that sits in behind that. Thank you. Um, kia ora, um, councillors, and I'm Claire Piper. I'm the uh, project coordinator for Innovating Streets. Uh, for the Christchurch City Council. Innovating Streets is a program and funding opportunity through Waka Kotahi um, where we've received 90% funding for some of the, for all of these projects that we've got before us today. This is the first of about five projects that Council is um, running. Um, and the, the whole concept around Innovating Streets is to trial and test uh, new ways of doing things in a very lighter, quicker, cheaper way of uh, the methodology, but also using a place-making approach where we interact um, very more so um, in, con in consultation and co-design with the community at the heart of all of our projects. Um, hopefully we have a, a map in front of you right now. That So the context for this project sits within the wider context of our cycleways that we have in Christchurch. So we have um, to the left the St Asif Street separated cycleway that's been completed, and to the right the Heathkit Express cycleway, it's a major cycle route, that's a separated cycleway as well. What we're looking at is the green part in the middle, that's our cycle connection project. So currently the cycle lane is in the road and it's a bit of a missing connection there between the two cycleways for the city. So 
So what we're aiming to do today is for the council to approve uh, the, the uh, resolutions that enable the safe and successful implementation of this trial that will see some changes in the road reserve area. Um, are there any questions for staff on this? Melanie and then Yani. Um, just looking at the map, and this is quite detailed, so look, so there's a two-way cycleway along one part of it, and then it sort of splits up and then becomes a two-way cycleway on each side of the road. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. So it, how challenging will it be for cyclists who are going whichever way it is when they have to cross the road to get onto the other it, it won't be difficult. So we've been down to site quite a few times in the peak hours and off peak hours to see how the road actually functions. And because we've got those traffic lights at Fitzgerald and at Barbados Street, they're creating big gaps in the traffic flow. So there's most cyclists won't have to wait. And if they do have to wait, it'll only be for a few seconds before they can safely cross the road. Okay, cool. Yanni? Thank you. Um, I just had two questions. Um, under 6.8, on page 162, the accessibility considerations. It said the project team has met with and include feedback in the de design from accessibility group representatives. Yes. Um, and it goes on to list them. Is there anything that they raised that we haven't changed in the design? That we haven't changed? No. We, right. we did, sign um, one of the proposals for the project was uh, road art, which is um, painting on the active um, road carriageway. As a result of consultation with them and with the NCTA safety team, we've rem removed it. Right. So, and that's got a lot. A lot of it has to do with um, colour, low, low vision, um, those um, with disabilities and dementia that might be using this um, area. Mm -hmm. So, we've removed it um, for the time being, um, and we've retained the shoulder road painting as part of um, adding amenity to the area. Okay, great. And then I just, I, I know it was mentioned in here somewhere, but I'm just struggling to find it. Sorry. Um, there is talk of a safety audit. So just to be clear, we've done a safety audit of the design, mm -hmm. the pre-construction <laughs> audit, and we'll do a post-construction audit. Correct. Um, are we able to get circulated that safety audit that we've, we've done? Um, we don't usually circulate them. Um, so the safety audit process is quite complex, not necessarily on this one, this one's quite straightforward. Right. But we, we, as far as I'm aware, we've never really circulated them. Yeah. I'm just mindful, before. I guess, of what happened previously with this intersection, St. Asif Street, Ferry Road. Also mindful of where we've had council staff come back around some of our cycleways with urgent safety recommendations post-construction. So I just think it's, I mean, I just think it'd be really good to get some sense of what the safety yeah. concerns are. So, yeah, so and then once it's done, then we can we can address it. What we'd usually do is we'd usually do a scheme stage safety audit, so that's at concept level. We'll do a detailed design stage safety audit and then we'll do a post-construction stage. Now this project's slightly different because it's, in theory, it's, it's mostly temporary. So if there's any issues, we can just go in and change it in a couple of days. So what we've done instead is we've done a combined scheme stage and detailed design stage safety audit. Right. We've agreed with every single auditor recommendation on there and we made substantial changes to our plans. And then we'll do a walk over with the auditors cool. for the detail the post-construction stage safety audit and then if there's any issues that come up we can change it sort of in two or three days and we'll look we can change them under TMP yeah and then we can come back and ask for resolutions afterwards that's great so we could just get that circulated though basically I can't see any reason why we couldn't get that circulated um, yeah I mean we, we generally don't just because there's a, a context um, about it um, uh, and we, look, we're happy to, to action the, 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 the items that get raised. It's just so we can have, an, like, as a local elected rep, it's just so we can have an awareness of what some of the concerns are. So we, if we get feedback from the community, we're, we're better informed. I mean, I mean, I support this project, and I, I really commend you for all the work you've done and the engagement, um, but I just given some of the track record on some of these things mm -hmm. and what we've seen, I just personally find it would be helpful to understand what the safety concerns have been raised are in a bit more detail. Would it be helpful Thanks. to get a briefing for the community board so that, I mean, if, if there is concern about documentation that is without context and in isolation and a technical report, it might be better to have arrange for the people that wrote it to come and give a briefing to the community board? Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds excellent. 
um, because as part of that process, we've got a, a very uh, intensive monitoring and evaluation program wrapped around this project and around all of our Innovating Streets projects. This seeks us having um, different methods of ways that the users of that area can feed back to us. So they've got my direct contact details, for example. Um, we've got a, a web, web page and that will go on Have Your Say as well, so we'll be seeking feedback via that way, as well as uh, developing a new um, GIS online tool that can drop a pin at a location and people can comment on that. Yeah, I don't, we'll, I don't doubt what you're we'll saying, be, sorry. We'll be but pulling that feedback and that monitoring um, a week after the project has been had its completion uh, and then a second week and then every fortnight and then dropping down to every month. That will occur for the duration of the entire project. So however long this project is in place, we will be having active monitoring and evaluation of the project itself. And as um, Bill has said, what we can do is we can, if the planters are in the wrong place because someone needs access to their driveway, we'll go out and move them straight away. And if there's any issues that have been raised, we're going to address them straight away. Yeah, but what I heard staff say is you've done a safety audit yes. and you've agreed with everything that's in it. Yes. And I would have thought just providing a sort of the chart with, or, you know, just the table of here's what the safety audit recommended, here's what we've done. But, but I can't see why we'd need a briefing on that. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to have the briefing. Has the but community just, board had a briefing on the whole project, have they? We did right at the start, and this was what was raised. Um, and, you know, I mean, I don't um, go into history, but we're still waiting to get the safety brief, the post construction safety brief on the, on the one of the MCRs through the Sheldon Street Kama Terrace area. Then that's been over a year, and it came to council as urgent, and we've still had no briefing on it. So, I mean, I just can't see the harm in circulating what the safety concerns were identified and how they've been addressed, if it's possible. But happy for the board to get a briefing. I just thought it would have been a simple piece of information that we could have had circulated. Can we take it under advisement? I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing two things. I wasn't aware that this was an issue, so um, sometimes it can be helpful to, to know in advance of a meeting that, that people have a concern and then I can arrange for people to have, to come brief with the um, re response. But look, I mean, I, I think we can get an update note in the meantime. Yeah. Um, this is going to be subject to an ongoing basis. This is, although it's part of a wider um, network approach to major cycleway routes, it is also um, utilising an innovative streets um, uh, project funding mechanism to, to, to give it a go in a different way, uh, which is to be commended. So, thank you. If, if, um, sorry. If I've got several. Could, sorry, could I just add to something about the safety audit? I think just um, the safety audits go through a process and um, auditors raise their concerns and um, then the designers review those and look at those in the context of the overall design. So, it's not necessarily every item that's raised by safety orders gets actioned because it may not necessarily need to be. So, um, and there's a whole process that we work through, so that's that's why I guess there's a bit of hesitancy. Right. And why it may be better just to do, um, to put Another a bit of context around it rather than for, uh, release So do you time. work together with the auditors to, yeah. to, to, to essentially, nice. so they do an initial sort of kind of evaluation from their perspective and then they work through that with the... Yeah, so in, in terms of process, the auditor will make a recommendation and then as the designer, I will respond either accepting or disagreeing or proposing an alternate solution. And then that will go back to them for them to comment on and then it will go to our safety engineer and then it will go to our client who's usually the project manager. So it does go through uh, an iterative process, I suppose, to make sure everyone's in agreement. If there is disagreement, it will go to our transport steering group as well, which is made up of people such as Stefan and Lynette to get approval for the disagreement. Right. So, is there um, is uh, were there any um, outstanding areas of concern as a result of that process? Not on this one, no. No, not on this one. Okay. So, I'm I'm comfortable that we just leave it where it is, um, uh, just with a, 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 a brief note to council, is just with an update of that process. All right. Um, so, I've got um, Sarah, Aaron, Pauline, and Mike. That's good, a good thing to do at a meeting, is to acknowledge that your question has been asked and answered. And we will be um, coming back to the community board with uh, the 
results of, of that monitoring as well. Yeah. I'll Excellent. be giving feedback as I break down it. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Aaron. Um, yeah, two quick questions. Um, one is a follow-up from um, Councillor Coker's question around that, where they, that crossing point in the middle. So we've got one of those on the, uh, up the top end of Colombo Street. Uh, I've used it maybe 30 times myself, never seen any incidents, but has there been any incidents there? Seems to work, but has there been any? At that one, I don't believe so, but I'd have okay. to double check. I know that there has been, they've had some difficulties at some other ones, right. but this is a very different road. This is very quiet. It's right. similar to top it's similar of the to when yeah. Columbus Street, but mm. when I've used it on Columbus Street, I've noticed cyclists aren't necessarily waiting for the lights before they oh, cross. Oh no! So we're, we've taken that. that on board when we've designed this. Yeah. So it was the same. No, it wasn't the same designers, but it was a major cycle route team who did our audit. Yeah. So they're well aware of how those crossings work, and they're the ones who recommended this treatment. Originally, we were going to have cars giving way to cycles, right? But they suggested we make it cycles give way because they're not going to have to for most of the time. Brilliant. Okay, well answered. And the other one is the um, the ski ramp for mice that you brought in. Wonderful. What is uh, you brought it in yes. and then not said anything about it? No. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so, as, as, so some of these projects, people well, ask, the where's the innovation? See. Where's the interesting elements? So you'll see on the plans, there's wonderful colours that are going to be added in. And some of you that've been around um, post quake. You would have seen some of the street um, painting, that, the road painting that um, the Urban Regeneration team did um, in the city at that time. So that's part of the um, innovation is, is adding colour and vibrancy back into the central city through some of this paint. But along the way, we've looked at different <coughs> um, materials and how they can be innovative. So using things in a different way, in a more creative way. What we have in front of you is a wave delineator. Its um, primary purpose and design is as a cycle uh, separator. And this situation, we're, not, we're using it somewhat as a cycle separator, but along the painted, um, the painted sections, what we didn't want is people to drive on those painted sections. So there's some planters there, but there's nothing really stopping anyone from you know, curving in and parking in there. So we've got these from America. We're very lucky we did the order in time. So <laughs> we've got them at our um, fingertips, and I can say that we will be the first council in New Zealand to implement this product. Uh, Auckland Transport are trying really hard. Um, I think their uh, container is delayed. <laughs> so that's a shame. Um, so we will be the first. So that's the innovation, is using uh, a, an existing product in a different way to add uh, a bit more texture and, and creativity to the design. Also, another innovation um, that we're using is on the bus platform um, at the Ara one-way section. Um, you'll see there's some kind of pebbly style um, dots on the plan. They are called um, LED limbo seats. And if you want to Google them, feel free. The only time they've ever been seen is at Vivid Sydney. So we will be the first in New Zealand to have those um, pebble uh, LED seats. They will be lit at night. Okay. The idea here is to create an, an interesting um, Instagrammable moment around PT to encourage people that that's a really cool spot to be. Um, and so we're looking forward to having those and they are in New Zealand as well. So we're very blessed that we haven't had the same delays as other councils with um, getting materials and assets uh, to deliver these innovating streets projects. Thank you. Well, well spotted, Aaron. I hadn't noticed that. Uh, Pauline and Mike. Yeah, well, actually, funnily enough, that was going to be my question too, to ask you to outline the temporary nature of this and the innovative um, aspects of it, which you've pretty much done. I think you've covered everything. So the other things would be, um, I guess, the colourful paint is different. And um, so you've got the cycle lane in the green and then the colourful paint... What does that do on the outside of that? The colourful paint is, is basically the leftover space, for example, as we're narrowing the road carriageway um, as a result of needing to keep the speeds down. So you'll see that one of the key moves and the resolutions you'll be um, supporting today is the uh, the speed limit reduction from 50 k's to 30 k's. Yeah. So some of that relates to how the design of the street is done. And so what we've got is we've got this shoulder. So yeah. we've decided to um, give it a, a bit of vibrancy in that area using um, paint. It's uh, anti-slip paint, um, yeah. so it's, it's really good. Um, and our team are really excited to get it on the road and add colour to that area. Great. And so I think that what you're saying there is because you've got all this funky fun stuff going on here now that people will just naturally slow down. That's great. We hope. Could I, it looks awesome. Can I just add to that? 
So the, yeah. the, the Innovating Streets concept is that you design like a normal road design and then you bring it back and you make it a temporary one. So those painted areas in the sort of the traditional design would actually be landscaping. So it would be either berms and trees or rain gardens and stuff like that. So that's really one of the things we're testing is if we do we need that space and if we if we do or if we don't need it we need it as a separator so in the final design that would hopefully be planted up like Durham Street. Or could it be remain as funky it, it, painting? It, it, it could. You just got an ongoing maintenance yeah. cost of that you'd have to you'd have to repaint it quite frequently. Oh I see. It'd yeah. be sort of every two years or so you'd have to repaint. But yeah. yes, yes you could. But then trees <coughs> need maintenance too so um, I think colourful, colourful <laughs> roads are quite interesting, and I think they do have a, a good effect on slowing people down. So it'll be interesting to watch this project. Thank you. Good, uh, Mike. Thank you. Just a couple of quick questions um, on, on the design. Um, I just noticed on Ferry Road at the Barbados uh, intersection heading west, you've got a stop box there, which is in line with the left turning lane, well, shouldn't that be an advanced one just in front of it, just to give it a bit more visibility for people in cars or cycle? You mean move it further towards the um, pedestrian crossing area? Oh, yeah, that one. Um, yeah, we can move that slightly further forward. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, the exit of Williams Street um, being a good way and going into a, um, I guess, a bi-directional uh, cycleway, which is the, the concern obviously with bi-directional ones. Uh, are you happy with the foot being a good way instead of um, a stop to actually make people stop? And yeah, there's look? really good visibility there. I mean, we can change it to a stop, but there's good visibility there. I, I guess it's just the the habit, I guess, of, of people when they to, to, I guess, coast through a, a good way just looking in, in the one direction, not expecting um, a cyclist to be coming. And, and that would obviously get used by a quite a few people during school term and I'm just wondering if potentially um, just to get people in the habit of stopping to, to look and, and check both directions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's, oh Phil Major. Thank you guys, and just James. a couple of questions. That it's probably in here and I haven't seen it, that how much is the total cost? I know we're getting 90%, but what's the total number? The total cost of delivering the entire project? Uh-huh. Roughly. Isn't that important? 750,000. 750, okay. Now, just so I'm on the right track, that all the build-outs and stuff like that, they're all the temporary things and that there's no curb and channels being shifted. It's all... There's, there's some kerb and channel at the bus stops outside Ara because we have to have a certain height kerb to allow people in wheelchairs or mobility issues to get on. Or do they? Um, yeah. That is it, though. The yeah. rest of it. Oh, and you have to take some of the kerbs out at the intersection with St. Asif Street because it, it's been built for a one way cycleway and we need it to be bi directional, but yeah. we're just going to knock them off. And then so it's only, it's only minor yeah, change minor. things. Um, and do the locals down there know that they might be going to lose about half their car parks? Are they aware of that? Okay, righto. And roughly, how long is it in for? As long as we like, or? Until the permanent scheme comes through, yes. Right, okay, thank you. James. Kia ora. Um, hey, look, I share Mike's um, concerns about the give way sign at Williams Street, to go exiting onto um, Ferry Road. I, I wasn't clear on what was going to happen about that. Oh, is it that easy? Oh, can I have one on my street? Um, no, the next thing is, <laughs> next thing is, so this uh, get, thingy there, is, is that a sep... I missed the point, I think. Is that the separator between cars and, and bikes, is it? That, yeah. You know, I, I know we're talking about in, um, innovation and so on, but I do worry about those things because, and I'm very supportive of cycles, I've got to say, I'll put that on the table. Um, but you know the bollards that are in some places around town, I think car, some people enjoy driving over them and wrecking them. How's that going to stand up? Uh, 
we brought it here so that you can have a have a, a tactile moment with it, if you like. Uh, we have had um, our, our traffic uh, operations and engineers have a really good play with it, including two people trying to go all the way along to see if it'll break. It hasn't. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, we're quite active uh, checking to see if it, it works. Um, we're quite happy and satisfied that it will work. The thing about it is it's going to be donor bolted down into the road. If it doesn't work, we'll take it out. Yeah, no. yeah. You haven't seen Council of Majors' late, latest vehicle, though. Um, <laughs> but it, you will on social media soon. But, um, <laughs> yeah, look, the, one other thing, though, is I notice, and, and I know that I, I see we've got some good points scoring in against Auckland about this and that yeah. and so on. But one thing I think they do do well with their cycle lanes, I think they are, um, ways at least, is that they've got um, quite thick, the, these things are dyna bolted into the ground, uh, you'll have seen them I guess, those little yellow ones are not bollards and they're really effective like on St Luke's Road there, mm -hmm. I, I see that regularly. So do we do that here? Yeah, they, they are quite effective and you can use them. I'd be a little bit concerned with the way children are crossing the road around the school that it could become a bit of a tripping hazard because they are so low. And those right. kids just come out the gate and just sort of swarm across the road to the cars. Um, we've, we've got these now, so I'd suggest we use them. But if these aren't working, we can look at a solution such as that, yeah. Yeah, OK. Right. Well, good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? There appear to be none. Who would like to move this? Jake will move it and seconded by Sarah. Uh, is there any debate while people are having a play? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Seems like a very strong product. <laughs> so I've got, um, it's, um, it's been moved and seconded by um, Jake and Sarah. Debate, Sarah. Just quickly, thank you so much for all the work on this. I know the board were really excited when we f saw the original design, but gutted not to have the big, um, the, the 3D visual thing um, on the road, but that's the way that goes. Um, I mean, the focus has been, I guess, in the discussion so far on the innovation and the materials being used, but actually for me the key innovation is in the process. Um, and we've been wanting for ages to be able to trial something before we put it in so people can experience it, see what it's really like, we can make tweaks and changes um, beforehand, which is the key thing. And the fact that Waka Kotahi have now made it easier for us to do this by both changing some of the guidelines and giving us funding um, has been really important. Um, ahead of now, um, we'd have had to pay for anything like this 100%. And it's not as cheap as you might expect with temporary stuff. There's a whole pile of stuff goes into it. Um, so that's going to make this um, a, a real game changer, I think, for this area. Um, there's a lot of people coming up um, Ferry Road now and heading to St Asif Street. And I hear a lot of comments from people saying, when's council going to do this bit? And I'm now able to say, it's coming very, very soon, um, which is really good. So thank you so much for your work on that. I know the school kids have been really engaged and interested. Um, and I look forward to seeing how it goes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Aaron? Um, yeah, I'll start by agreeing with Sarah, pretty much 100% um, on this. Uh, and it has been a bit weird being down around there and seeing that gap of the, you know, you've got one major cycleway there and then you've got St Asif Street along there, so the two not connecting up, so agree there. Um, and I will raise Phil's point around the parking, and the thing here is that, again, it's temporary, so if the taking away the parking doesn't work and the businesses can come in and say, hey, look, it hasn't worked for this reason or whoever, um, it can be changed. It can, it can uh, go back. The Rainbow Roads, I think that's something that's going to stick. Going back to Pauline's point, I think they will probably be more successful than we give them credit for. Um, I think uh, uh, they'll be a point of interest. They will slow people, um, and I think people really won't drive on them. Um, it'll be out of respect for uh, the, the, it appears like a piece of art. So um, I'm impressed by all of that. This here is kind of what I think we should have done with every single major cycleway in the city. We should be do them all temporary 
and then see which bits work, which bits don't, uh, and then change them around and work with our communities first to uh, get the designs right, and that's what's happened here. Uh, the concept of the tactical urbanism, I think, is fantastic. This, I think it'll be proved here to be good. I don't think this will be the final design. I think there will be changes, um, but those changes uh, will be, like you say, really, really quick, and if there are problems. So this kind of is like doing a cycleway with the community rather than to the community, and I think that'll have a better outcome for getting more people on bikes, and uh, this is exactly what our board had asked for for Herewood Road. Thank you. Is there any other comments? I'll um, put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed aye. say no. That's carried. visit as part of this project as it's an exemplar for uh, Waka Kotahi. So we look forward to, in due course in March, when it's final completion, to invite you to come along and join us. Excellent. Thank you. We'll let you know when the Minister lets us know when of his availability. This year. This year. Yeah, this year, this year. This year. Right. So the next, um, the next item on the agenda is the resolution to exclude the public. And... Uh, I just wanted to, um, I'm going to uh, move uh, that, um, uh, that we adopt uh, the resolution to exclude the public set out on pages 168 to 170 um, of the agenda. Um, and that, uh, but I did want to make a note that with regard to public excluded item 12, uh, the intention is, and I know that the wording on the current um, agenda item is otherwise, but it is, it is my intention to uh, move in the context of the item that Council agree to release this report and the f that on excluded item number 12, that the Council will agree to release this report and the final letter of expectations to the public when Christchurch City Holdings has received the final letter of expectations and with the approval of the Chief Executive of the Council in consultation with the Chief Executive of Christchurch City Holdings. Um, and and that, that was an issue that was raised. Um, and, uh, and the way that the wording of the original resolution was, was that this item wouldn't be released until the statement of intent. Um, because of course there is a process that goes uh, letter of intent to CCHL, as we have a holdings company arrangement, unlike other councils um, in New Zealand, we have a holdings company, so we, set, we give a letter of expectations to the holdings company, and the holdings company then come back with a statement of expectations, which we then discuss with them, give them feedback on, and hopefully come to a point where we can when we can um, uh, receive their statement of expectations. But at that point, we simply receive it um, rather than adopt it because it is a process uh, that um, separates that decision to the board of CCHL. So, um, so the draft letter of expectations that we're looking at today will become hopefully a final letter of expectations uh, which we will release um, once we know that uh, CCHL has received it and has been able to, to forward it to its board members and to the appropriate um, people that need to see it um, before it's public. So, um, so I will um, I look for a seconder for the motion, uh, James Daniels, and uh, I'll open up for debate. So, um, uh, question. Just because it was raised in the deputation earlier around another council doing theirs in public, do you and those people are still here, do you have an answer for that why we would not do ours in public when another council does? Uh, the, the other council is um, a direct shareholder um, in uh, the airport company, which I think is, is a different issue. But, I mean, I think that we do need to review the statement of intent uh, process mm -hmm. and that we should undertake to do that um, but I, I, don't, I kind of we have to get the letter of expectations to the, the company to um, Christchurch City Holdings as soon as possible it's already late we are going to have to indicate to them that uh, 
we're extending the time for the statement of expectations. This was supposed to be sent to them in December last year. So, and it wasn't, um, it was referred to this meeting, so we have to refer it to this meeting. Um, it is, a, it is a, um, a draft at this stage and wouldn't be uh, generally available in a draft form until we'd had a proper opportunity to sit down and, 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 and workshop uh, the final content. And I've looked at the process that Queenstown have adopted by way of a working group that workshops these things prior to a statement of expectations um, being drafted. So it, it is a slightly different situation, but I think the issue that has been raised is one that requires us to consider whether we can improve the process that we have. And I'd like to take the time to get that process right before bringing a process paper back to council um, to get us on the right track in the future. But this letter has to go um, now as soon as possible because we are already delayed. Uh, Andrew. Thank you. Um, the, the point has been well made that the letter which is in... Is this uh, a question or a debate? Oh, are we, are we in questions at the moment? Well, that was a question and I answered the question. OK, um, I will ask a question in that case. I thought I'd missed the opportunity to do that, but I will ask a question. Um, in as much as the um, final letter is agreed and the report will be made public um, in the way that the Mayor has outlined, presumably the voting record could be made public at that time as well. Yes. Yep. Yep. Thank you. It's fine. The minutes of the meeting can be the minute that the minute associated with it can be made public as Including well. Including the voting yep. record. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'll open it up for debate. Um, Yanni. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I just want to be clear that I really appreciate the deputation or the public participation that was made this morning. But even before that, we heard those words from the people of our city, I've consistently said that I'm opposed to doing letters of expectation in public excluded. I can see no basis for doing it. In fact, we just heard earlier today that we beat Auckland at something in terms of this um, urban cycleway. Well, guess what? Auckland does their draft letters of expectation in public with full transparency. And I think we should be adopting that process um, to be best in the field rather than just putting these things in public excluded consistently when we know, and I've previously advised council colleagues, that other councils do do it in public previously. So I can see no reason why we shouldn't be doing this with transparency. We are facing the most challenging times in recent history in terms of the COVID-19 impact and the climate change impact on our society. And I believe the community deserves to have full transparency around the strategic directions being asked of our holdings company and our CCOs. This city was once labelled the People's Republic of Christchurch as an insult, and yet that slogan was adopted with pride by the people in our city because we held on to our public assets. Our CCOs and our council holding company is a major part of who we are as a city and as a community. So I can see no reason why we should not be open, transparent and sharing with our community the strategic directions that we're asking our holdings company to adopt. I would also just conclude that the Auckland CCO report is really excellent in terms of understanding uh, some of the issues. And what's really interesting from that report is although while the companies said, and this is the Auckland companies I stress, said that they felt that they were being transparent and accountable, when they surveyed the community, it was really clear that the public did not view that. And that report notes the correct yardstick is responsiveness to the public and in particular the concerns of the public and that people consistently felt that they were not being listened to, that, that they were failure to involve local birds early on in important decisions affecting their ward, token consultation, engagement and a lack of responsiveness to complaints or criticism and an overemphasis on commercial considerations at the expense of public good and a lack of transparency. There are many lessons that we can learn from the Auckland CCO review. I note that this council in March 2016 asked for a governance manual in terms of how we improve the transparency around monitoring and giving direction to CCHL, and we still have not had that back, but I am told it's coming back in February. There's a lot of lessons that we can learn, and one of the most important 
is that we can do more and be more transparent with the strategic direction we give to our companies around remuneration and strategic direction. Andrew and James. Thank you. Um, the point has been made that the draft letter um, in front of us today, um, because of its draft form and its confidential nature, um, is not capable of being put into the public arena in that form. I think that means that we've got a need to focus on the processes around the draft letter of expectations, the letter of expectation, and the um, way that the draft statement of intent and final statement of intent is dealt with, um, so that we can deal with these matters um, in a way that best meets the needs of um, the process, and so that we get the best, um, the best process and best outcome possible. But at the same time, we do it in the most open and transparent way. The interest um, certainly should be, and no doubt will be, in the content of the final letter of expectation as delivered to CCHL, and I welcome the commitment to put that into the public arena as quickly as possible, so that the community can see, before the draft statement of intent is developed and presented back to Council, the expectations that we have of our company. Um, and that's the important part, that the output from this meeting is known as soon as possible um, so that the community can see what our expectations of the company actually are. I then expect that there will be an equal amount of interest in the way that the company responds to the letter of expectations as finalised in this meeting and publicised. Um, and then in the final statement of intent, and then in the reporting that comes to the Finance and Performance Committee of performance against that statement of intent. So I think there's a need for us to review the way that we deal with these letters in future, um, noting the way that this report has been presented today and the time constraints around it. But I equally think that there needs to be a good understanding of the processes, the transparency and the accountability of all of the parts of this process, not just the way that the draft letter of expectations is dealt with. And that transfers right through to the acceptance of the statement of intent, the content of the statement of intent, and then the accountability on the part of the company in the way that it reports back to the Finance and Performance Committee on an ongoing basis once this process is concluded. Uh, James? I'm just flagging that I will abstain from the vote only because I'm conflicted on the item, so I can't vote on it anyway. No, that, no, that is not correct on this item. On the item of... Um, letter of expectation. Letter of expectation. No, sorry. On the item of... Um, that, the, that the resolution be adopted... Uh, uh, sorry, the resolution around um, public exclusion and that um, the item... 12, it's a noting that we're simply noting that we will agree to release the report and the final letter of expectations to the public. That's after it's been adopted. So it is a technical procedural matter. That's and, fine. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that... We're conflicted on this matter. We will be conflicted. So in the... In the yeah, four in of the, us won't vote on When the item comes to the 12. table, we can participate in the discussion. We cannot participate in the debate no. and we cannot vote on it. Yeah, and I understand that. So I, I was just flagging that because what this debate is about no. is in relation it's, to... It's not in relation no. to the... the, the, the well, the not people specific, talking about the letter of expectation. It's not in relation to the content. It is a procedural debate. <laughs> about whether or not the letter of expectation debate is held in public or public excluded. And given that I'm not voting on it, I will just do what we're told. You know, I'm not voting on writing a letter to ourselves anyway, so... Yep. Can I just flag that I'm abstaining? <laughs> You, you can abstain, yeah. I mean, it's, that's, that's your choice. Uh, uh, Aaron. I just request that you put going into item 12 separate, please. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there any other debate? Um, right. So I will... Um, I'll put the motion, uh, and I will uh, deal with the um, the section that in includes uh, item 
12. So the, 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 the I'll, I'll deal with the vote on item 12. So item 12 is being dealt with separately by way of a separate vote. So I'll put that motion. All those in say, favour say aye. Aye. Uh, hey? I'm doing 12 first. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. No. Well, hang on. That um, I, I, I think it might be better that you just um, poll the meeting. Um, mm. Aye. Councillor Turner? Yes. Councillor Chen? No. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Coker? No. Councillor Cotter? Yes. Councillor Daniels? Yes. Councillor Davidson? No. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Goff? Abstention. Yep. Councillor Sorry, that was a, sorry. I didn't switch my microphone on, so the vote has been carried. Um, uh, sorry, lost, and so therefore we will now move on to item 12 uh, on the agenda. And I will, uh, I'm, but I'm taking an adjournment for morning tea. We're we're almost on 11 o'clock, so um, in fact I'll I'll make the adjournment until 11:15. So 11:15 we will recommence the meeting. So thank you very much.
we'll move on to item 12, uh, Christchurch City Holdings Limited Draft Letter of Expectations 2021 to 2022. Um, because I'm a director of um, CCHL, I'm going to have to vacate the chair. And because the deputy mayor is also a director of CCHL, he cannot assume the chair. So um, I will call on the meeting to nominate someone to chair the meeting for item 12. I'd like to nominate James Daniels um, to chair. Is there a seconder for that? Uh, Mike Davidson. Aaron? Oh. No offence to James. I was going to um, nominate Yanni because he's been here for 50 years. Right. I'll refer James to do it. I just had a procedural question. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so, so, but uh, do, uh, do you want to nominate Yanni as well? Oh, not if he's backing James, I'll back James then. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Uh, Yanni? Sorry, I, I was just going to check, now that um, we're not going into public excluded, is it possible to make the report available to the public? Yes, th th there were some last minute changes made to it um, uh, this morning. It was only published this morning after our workshop on right. Tuesday. So um, it was only published for our information this morning, yeah. um, and so uh, it hadn't. And, and there were a couple of changes that that needed to be made to it. Uh, I think that a couple of the workshop uh, recommendations hadn't quite been picked up in the language. So that's been um, fixed up, as I understand it. So it should be ready for publication now. Um, it will be in just a few moments. It will be in just a few moments. So it will be it will be online. Um, but councillors will have it on the hub. Yes, it's can can it's we get a, some hard copies for the people that are here? We're, they're trying to get it online electronically. Right, okay. Can't just do more than one thing at a time. Yep. So um, okay. if you could get someone, we could get a couple of hard copies from. It will just take a few moments. It will just take a few moments because there isn't a printer in the chamber. So we will get we'll get to that. Um, as soon as possible, but um, if we slowly take our way through to um, uh, voting a in a chair, uh, then that will assist the process of getting the documentation in the public arena um, as quickly as possible. So, um, I have a I have the position of uh, chair for item 12 um, has been moved and seconded. Are there any other nominations? I will therefore uh, put the motion that James Daniels take the chair for item 12. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed aye. say no. That's carried. Thank you. And the CCHL directors will step back from the table and not participate in the item. I'll tell you that you can sit here. Kia ora tato. If I had known I was going to be in this uh, position, I'd have worn um, my rugby club jersey to represent Shirley Rugby Club. However, um, however, look, it's um, something I've just assumed, this role I've just assumed, so I ask, call on my colleagues to uh, assist me through, me and us through this very important um, paper we're, we're considering this morning. So I welcome to the, the uh, table Linda Gibb, um, Performance Monitoring Advisor from City Council, Diane Brandish, the uh, Acting General Manager of Finance and Commercial, and Ian Thompson, our General Counsel for, for uh, City Council, and ask you to uh, take us through this paper, this report. First thing I would like to start with is just to talk to the purpose of an LOE. It is an administrative tool used to convey shareholders high-level key strategic expectations of the company, or in the case of the letter to CCHL, um, to CCHL who then will, put, will transmit 
expectations through to each of the companies in the group. Um, on receipt of an LOE, the board will consider the content and it will, taking into account its own obligations under the Companies Act to act in the best interests of the company, will either will do one of two things. It will either uh, agree and uh, action those expectations or our, uh, we would expect them to come back to us and to want to discuss with you any of the expectations that it cannot, uh, it will, uh, that it feels it cannot progress. Um, the content of the LOE should, where it's agreed by the company, then be reflected in the statement of intent. Uh, but it's important to note that the um, letter of expectation is a high-level strategic document. There is some content that may not be appropriate for the level of an SOI, which is also high-level, um, but it should be, the expectations will flow through to business plans, and that is why we issue an LOE before, in this case, CCHL Group works through its business plans so that that all comes together into the SOI. Uh, when we get the SOI, it's a draft and it's due, it's a statutory obligation due on the 1st of March and we review the SOI uh, to, to understand the extent to which the expectations have been uh, reflected in there. We'll staff advise you of any omissions there'll be engagement on that, and then the final SOI will reflect comments made and engagement had. That covers the purpose and the process. Um, in developing letters of expectation, we have generally <coughs> um, engaged, well, we've had the, actually, we've had the, the experience over a course of a year to see where councillors are uh, what their issues are as they're raised from time to time in regular briefings that uh, CCHL provides. We've um, generally we would hold a workshop. Uh, we didn't this year because of the delays um, in well the, the encumbrance of the COVID-19 lockdown followed by the pressures that came up after that. Uh, we focused the LOE primarily on recovery. We've heard feedback from council that they wanted strength, or that you wanted strengthening of the climate change and governance provisions of the <coughs> LOE. And this final LOE, or final draft LOE, reflects those conversations. Okay, so, it's fair to say, given that this is now in public um, and it wasn't expected to be so, the, anyone who's watching and here attending doesn't have much in the way of documentation at this stage. Is that, am I correct? So in other words, the draft LOE that we've got is not widely available in this chamber. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, that's right. That is correct, yeah. We're, we're, uh, Chair, we're just about to have five copies handed out. So, okay. we've got them. so we're going to need to, um, uh, we, we will do that, but of course uh, people who are, are participating by um, uh, being here will not be able to, uh, to see what we're talking about. Nevertheless, I think it's important that we, we get on with it because as you've already indicated, we're, we've got a time pressure and that we're behind, uh, did I get that right? We're behind time now in terms of the letter, the timeline for the letter of expectation. Yes. And the uh, statement of intent is due back from C CCHL on the 1st of March? The draft version the draft. is, yes. yes. Yeah. We have offered, because we are now running about a month behind or thereabouts, we have offered that if they need it, 
we can give them a one month extension that's provided for in the uh, Local Government Act. That's fine, okay. So do I have any questions from the, uh, around the chamber? Yanni? Thank you. Um, thank you for your description at the start, the explanation. I was just wondering if you've considered using a statement of expectation, which I understand is a tool that we can use, that can set out in some detail some quite clear outcomes that we would like from our um, CCOs and CCHL and why we haven't used that mechanism. Um, the statement of expectations is uh, a new tool added to um, the governance toolbox by the um, in the LGA amendments of 2019. Um, the letter of expectation has been a long held tool that is commonly understood uh, by both the Crown and local government and in reading the Statement of, uh, statement of expectation clause, it didn't appear to offer anything other than uh, some legal status that we weren't able to get through the LOE, so we've continued to issue an LOE. I think um, the Auckland Council review, uh, Auckland CCO review, indicated that the statement of expectation hasn't been used at all um, either by Auckland Council or anybody else um, and I think that its conclusion was for the same reasons that the LOE gets you where you need to be. So, I, I agree with, with Andrew's comments. Right, so just so I'm clear, there's nothing stopping us from doing a statement of expectation. If we resolve to do it, we could. Yes. You could. And it could do more than a letter of expectation, which isn't, the letter of expectation isn't a mandatory requirement. No, it's not, but historically it's been a, a kind of direction um, to our CCO, CCHL, as to what we would expect in the Statement of Intent. The Statement of Expectations in the Act is a much more broad, um, it takes a much more broad approach, talks about relationships with um, Māori and, and with the, the Council. The letter of expectations that the Council has been preparing, as I said, are a little more focused on what they would like to see in the Statement of Intent. But having, sorry, but having said that, there is no reason why the LOE could not include anything that is in the Statement, that, that, would, that might be included in the Statement of Expectations. It doesn't actually provide for us to do any more than we could otherwise because the Letter of Expectation is an administrative tool and its content is discretionary. Right. Um, can I just check in terms of the amended letter of expectation? There's, there's a number of changes that have been made since the workshop. Um, and I think we heard earlier today, this morning, that some things have been um, removed. Uh, in particular, for example, um, asking CCHL to continue um, monitoring around our request around executive remuneration, and I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite sure um, when that, you know, how that, why that decision was made to to amend it. So, is someone just able to kind of go through how the amendments have been made? Um, yes, I can talk to that. Um, we were asked <coughs> after the workshop um, Tuesday to to make the document less detailed and more of a, of a high-level strategic document. That um, sentence was actually omitted in error and has been put back in this morning. So, sorry, just um, put in, I, I put the question through ahead of the meeting yesterday morning. In the draft letter that we had at the workshop, it said that we would continue to request CCHL to um, report on our expectations of um, executive remuneration. I haven't had any copies of those reports. Are they, are they available? Are they still going to continue? Um, and, you know, I heard that we'd change the letter to take that out because they weren't doing that. So, 
Just um, was trying to understand that. So the, the actual reporting that CCHL does is not a report, it's a verbal um, report, I guess, on uh, what they have been able to do in that regard. It comes up usually every quarterly report and they talk to that issue. So what's our sense of how well they've been responding to what we've put in the letter of expectation in the statement of intent around senior executive remuneration? Well, I think that the nub of that issue is that the boards of the entities are the ones that are responsible for setting remuneration uh, and that there are a lot of um, trade-offs that they take into account when they're looking for their executives. Uh, CCHL has continuously advised that they have been very strong on their advice to their subsidiary boards about exercising restraint. They've also been quite clear that there is very little more they can do in that regard. Okay. To reinforce the I'll issue, Councillor Johansson, that statement in terms of expecting CCHL to continue to pursue that matter is in the letter of expectation. The, the concern, if I just raise the concern, the concern is we've repeatedly put that in and we don't know how that's being achieved. And you know that's why I thought the, the ongoing monitoring was quite important. And maybe we need to ask for an increase in the reporting around um, the things, but I've sent councillors a copy of a um, proposed amendment to address some of the remuneration thing through the um, statement of expectation request. So I'll just leave it for that. I'll just add though that uh, in version two that has now been circulated in the chamber, that uh, sentence or that issue of remuneration expectations has been, as uh, Linda said, has been restored to the letter and we're asking that CCHL briefs us on specific issues including that. Mm -hmm. So we will ask them for uh, updates through the year. It's not specific as to how many or how few <coughs> reports yeah. they make to us. Okay. Um, just the final question I have was in regards to the Taras Airport proposal, uh, I think what we're hearing from a community is that they really want the ability for council to provide some direction on that issue. And I appreciate it's in the early stage, but um, what could we put in the letter of expectation that would set out clearly to CCHL that we would expect that it, there's a clear decision-making framework that highlights where the community and elected members who are the major shareholder um, of the airport and also the full shareholder of CCHL have input? The revised draft was strengthened following the briefing the other day and actually now says that we we'll welcome the opportunity to work closer with CCHL and with their subsidiary companies to assure an effective and aligned approach to climate change. So it recognises the work they've been done and requests a um, closer working together. Now remember this is a strategic document, it's not a list of tasks, so that this change we feel encompasses what um, CCHL and the airport are working on. We, I, the question really is, can we have something very specific about the Terrace Airport proposal mm. that sets out a clear expectation <coughs> of how of, of the community and elected members being clear about who's making decisions and when and what the opportunity is for strategic direction input. Okay, I'd ask um, Ian Thompson as the general counsel to comment on that. Um, firstly, my, my, I support what um, Adai said, that this is a strategic document and um, it's not going to get down into the detail, the sort of detail that you're looking for. The other aspect to me also is that by making a, an amendment like that, the council does not really have sufficient information in front of it to um, to make that um, decision or to pass that resolution. And I would be very careful about um, going down that track. I think what the, we've got in the document, we've made it clear. CCHL know what we're talking about. Um, and it's just a, a instruction to CCHL that they 
continue to um, work with us, give us information as we want it. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of these sort of documents, to maintain the contact. And I think what's um, in there is perfectly fine. And I want to remind councillors that we had a briefing and a, a type of workshop the other day where we did discuss these matters. And as the general counsel says, this, this is a high level strategic letter of expectations. Any other questions? You've, are you finished, Yanni? Yeah, I'll, I'll save the rest for, for debate. Okay. Um, just, I mean, I've circulated the amendments to you. I'll send them to the Secretary and Dawn as well. Cool. Um, <coughs> thank you. Melanie. Um, I've got a number of amendments that I've forwarded around too, but I presume that we do that during the debate section, is that right? Yeah. Um, so my question is about... Um, uh, there's some, let me find it. Uh, it was under the governance um, section and the very last um, <coughs> sentence there, um, and where it talks about being the remuneration um, being directly linked to performance. So can you explain exactly what that means? Well, I think it's saying just what it says. Um, when we had the briefing the other day, you'll recall that the um, Chief Executive did say that monitoring the subsidiaries is wider than just monitoring their salaries. It's also about monitoring their performance and, and how they're delivering across all the things they've been asked to do. So monitoring salary alone would give you a very narrow perspective on what we have asked these subsidiaries to do in delivering mm. Council's strategic direction. <coughs> so this is talking about that wider view than just the very narrow view. So one way of um, reading that might be um, that a bonus might be given um, if there's good performance. So that, that's the way I interpret that, which is not necessarily something I support. I do think it actually says that. It's no, but that's, what I just, that's what sort I of how it reads to me. Okay. So, so it, when we get to debate, I'd like that bit to be removed. Okay, that was a question. All right. Further questions from um, Pauline? Just adding to what Melanie's trying to do here, I think rather than remove it, you'd like the wording clarified so that it doesn't <coughs> doesn't imply <coughs> bonuses are automatic for performance. Whereas Di's reading it in a converse manner to say that actually performance is valued, um, not just um, remuneration. Um, but um, the way this is written actually directly linked to performance actually um, does imply there could be bonuses. So maybe it's just, rather than deleting it, it's just fixing the wording. And if I can expand on that, and excuse me, Mr Chair, for cutting across, that's why I've added the words public sector organisations, because public sector organisations, and councils in particular, do not get bonuses. Right? We're not saying don't pay bonuses. We're simply saying, remember, you're part of the public sector. Yeah, sorry, Diane, can you just repeat that? What you just said. I'm saying that um, this council in particular does not pay bonuses and it's part of a public sector ethos that you are paid a salary to do and to deliver on your job right. but you don't get a bonus component. Now that, and I'm sorry I may have misled you, it doesn't apply necessarily to all public sectors but it certainly applies to this council and that's when we say and remember you're part of a public sector, we're not saying don't pay a bonus, we're saying be mindful that you are employed to deliver on your job. And as E.G. said, I also interpret it both ways, which is, you know, you were, you were there to deliver, to constantly show that you are delivering against the expectations of council. So to be clear, I thought you said that we don't pay bonuses in the CCHL group. No, I'm saying we don't pay bonuses in council. Oh, in council, right. Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you. Pauline, you finished? Right. Jake. Um, I'm not necessarily saying I have an opinion that we should be very prescriptive in, in our letters of intent, but um, I am really keen to get a really clear opinion-free answer. Is there anything stopping us legally to, from being incredibly prescriptive about what we'd like to see from CCHL? Ian. Um, the, uh, is, should really pretty much just be a yes or no. Right, well, as much as it. 
um, and Ian, before it. you answer that. Well, yes, that, that, that is an aspect of it. The, the, the point of these is to just, um, in a broad brushed way, give a, um, an expectation to CCHL what we would like to see in the statement of intent. Yes, you could um, specify something if you absolutely wanted to, but the point I made in terms of Councillor Johansson's amendment was that you're going down a track and making a decision in a situation where you don't really have enough information to make a decision of that nature, there, is a, there would be a lot of advice you would need to get as to whether or not, I mean, the, the relationships, the, the point that um, the Chief Executive made about the Companies Act, the obligations of both CCHL and the Council, um, the separation of their duties, their rights, all of that sort of thing, um, you've just no, well, that, that's important. And, and if you're going to talk about good process here, um, I don't think you're in a position to make that kind of call on the level of information that you have um, without making further inquiries and getting further advice. Um, now, that is my view. I, I just simply don't think you're in the right position and you are in breach of your obligations under the Act. And you and I have had that discussion before. Um, you in breach of your obligations under the Act if you would make a, deci a decision in those circumstances. Right. Are there any more questions? You're clear? Okay. Jimmy. Regarding the process, I mean, uh, based on this, the, uh, the later expectation as a strategic document, you know, we approved uh, today and uh, the release to the, uh, the CCHL. And I, I would like to know uh, uh, if all those the issue are uh, CCHL, you know, if uh, you know, some of the items need to be clarified, you know, more detailedly, what is the process feedback to us? Before they Present uh, the SOI to the council I'm because sorry. this high level, you know, probably uh, uh, interpretation, you know, maybe bias, etc. You know. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I, I, I mean, but because this high level strategic document yes. for those the later or expectation, am I right? Yes. We cover so many the uh, big items like a recovery, COVID nineteen recovery, yeah. prosperous economy. Yes. And also progress report, reporting, etc. I mean, if the interpretation has a misunderstanding, how to fill the gap? Then they can feedback to the council regarding to the practical SOI. So, what is what is the question? Just clearly state the question. Question is the uh, interpretation of those high level strategy. If the CCHL have a misunderstanding. Well, remembering that the letter of expectation sets yes. out obviously our expectations at a high level, and then their SOI. But we need to release to them, yes. Their SOI, statement of intent, is how they address our expectations. Where do you see the gap? If you don't mind, Jimmy, uh, what Jimmy's saying is that a lot of the statements are, are very, very broad, and yeah. various councillors have little more detailed bits, yeah. but they're not really covered in it. And I think that's pretty much what Jimmy's yeah, saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would have thought that when we were talk discussing this at, on Tuesday, that it was made clear that this is a high-level strategic document that we're, that we're considering right now, and then we'll hear more detail back from the company mm -hmm. through the statement of intent. But that, that's the point that Jimmy and Jake are raising, is it? Because does it strictly have to just be that, or can there be more detail, I think, is where it's going? I think the answer from Ian was fairly clear. Can yeah. you repeat, um, please? I, I come back to the point that if you're wanting to add in reference to something like the terrace development, you're not in a position to actually make that that call, make that decision. 
Um, can I, in, in, in terms of the different levels, we've got provisions in here around climate change, and that was the point being made by Eco's, um, Extinction Rebellion. Sorry. Um, and and we've, we've directed particular comments to the issue of climate change, and we would expect um, CCHL to um, reflect that in their statement of intent. So, and I, and I think that's at the the right level, the right pitch in terms of a letter of expectations. Jake, you have a follow-up. It's just so much opinion. Um, I'm not talking about tariffs at all. I'm talking about salaries and, and how oh, in okay. future, over not this year, but in, in subsequent years, if we wanted to be quite prescriptive on, on certain points, can you as staff, is there anything stopping the letter from being prescriptive if we want it to be? Maybe not now, not today, in future, on certain subjects, if we want it to be, and can you help us do that in future? Um, I'm sorry, I thought you were yeah, talking no, about sorry, the other issue. Um, in terms of remuneration, if, just to answer that point, um, Councillor Johansson mentioned um, Clause 36A of Schedule 7 of the Act, which um, entitles the Council to um, adopt a remuneration um, policy, but only for its employees, not for um, a CCO. So the CCO is separate from that, and um, you know it, it, it would go against the usual um, division of. Um, responsibilities and duties if the um, the council was to be prescriptive about something that it's actually CCO's responsibility to deal with. And yes, again, we've got in the letter of expectations um, the council's expectation in terms of remuneration. Um, but I think you, you, you wouldn't want to step over the line and, and interfere with the management of the company. Um, by saying anything more specific. Well, you're asking them to deliver stuff. You have to trust the board to know that they've got the right people there to deliver what we're asking them to deliver. So if you sit, if you restrict in one area, then I think you are, I agree with Ian, you are cutting across the role of the council and the role of CCHL. Yeah, I just want to remind all councillors that, and it's been stated before that, the companies are governed by the Companies Act, which is to uh, act in the best interests of the company. It doesn't even say of the shareholder, right? And so bear that in mind. But the other thing is that the um, <coughs> regarding remuneration, as um, Ian pointed out under sections 36A, Schedule 7 of the Act, it limits it, our, that uh, policy to council itself, not the company. So oh. can we clear that, can we clarify, uh, can we okay. um, understand that? Yeah, well that, that's exactly right. If it's a level of expectation, and so you've got elected members representing the public, and the public feedback to us stuff, one of them is, um, and it's in here, climate change. So the public, a percentage of the public have come to us and said, we want you to do more about it. We've put it in our level of expectation. So the expectation is those companies will, and there's some quite clear targets in here, and the point that um, Jake's raising is around remuneration because we have people from the public come to us and say, why is the gap so big between the top end and the bottom end at the companies you own? And if, you, uh, and if we were uh, trying to set a a reasonable level of expectation, uh, we would be saying that gap needs to narrow. We don't say that in here. We don't say over the coming years we want to see that gap narrow. Um, ben and Jerry's, for instance, had a, a five times rule. The CE couldn't be paid five times more than the lowest paid person. So, so if the top was going, the bottom had to go. Hang on. Is that a question? Um, yeah, it is a question. It's, uh, well, it started with a, a semi-statement. I learnt well from Councillor Daniels. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, that we've done it in one section here, but in the one that gets raised a lot by Councillors Johansson and, um, and now by uh, McLennan, that, 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 they, uh, that that one isn't addressed. And we're being told that it can't be, but it's only a level of expectation, that, and it would be simple just to say that that gap narrows. Just like we have with um, uh, emissions, we've said that's got to narrow. 
that has to change. Can we not do the same with salary, is the question. One, one of the um, requirements or obligations on a CCO in the Act is to be a good employer. Um, so you would expect the CCO to conduct itself in a way that it is a good employer and looks after its employees. Um, but I'd come back to the point that that is a matter for the company to determine as to whether or not they, um, they meet that obligation, rather than the council um, imposing um, rules on them. But we did it for climate change. Oh, no, it's, it's not as particular in, in climate change. We're, we're asking them to... Um, yeah, we have serious targets in climate change, which we'll set as a council, and then as a council we don't have get to have uh, set serious targets around um, the wealth gap in this country. And as a public employer, we should. We should be and saying... I'm going to, to call an end to this, uh, because that's for debate. We're on questions, and the uh, Chief Executive has a comment to make. So I just want to... ..in particular around pay restraints. There are two points made in the letter of expectation that are explicit. OK? The first is, we always, as always, we expect mm. CCHL Group to exercise restraint in the level of senior executive total remuneration, and there's a little bit more, uh, taking into consideration, the, into account, the public service nature of the positions. And you, in your deliberations through the last year, have actually seen that take effect in certain board appointments in particular. At the end of that paragraph, it continues to clearly state remuneration packages should reflect that the companies are public sector organisations and be directly linked to performance. That's probably the strongest you've had it in your letter of expectation over many, many years. Madam Senior, that doesn't address the gap, though, and that's the problem in this country in the last 20 years is the gap has just really started spreading. Yes, the bottom end has come up, definitely. I'll acknowledge that. But the top end has moved a lot more than the bottom. We're, we're moving like that as a country. The pay difference between a policeman, a school being teacher generous, I, and an MP many being years generous, ago was I'll let 10%. you have that much to say yeah. about it, but I'll leave that for debate. Any more questions? Questions only. Yanni. The, the really hub of the question is, for the last, I don't know, few years, five, maybe a little bit longer, ten, um, we've put the similar wording in about senior executive remuneration, and it hasn't actually achieved very much restraint at all, and I can go through and quote you the increases, um, which have been very significant, and actually a lot of the, the significant increases were directly linked to performance outside sometimes of the question, uh, sorry, outside sometimes of the circumstance of, of that individual employee. So the question is, is just repeating the same thing that we've always repeated going to achieve what we want? And why do we have confidence that putting this in will actually lead to an improvement when we haven't seen that in the past? Who's that question directed oh, at? To the people that... Because I'll answer it if you want. Put it in. On behalf but of the... You know, like the meeting. Is there okay. anything further I'll answer it then, that we can way. do? Yes, yes, there is. It's for us to be vigilant regarding this uh, LOE and then the statement of intent. It's, it's our responsibility to keep knocking on that door. We don't just let them run off and do what they want. They, they come back to us and report to us. With so it's up to us to call them out on it. With respect, we, some of us have been doing that for at least 10 years. And we've, what we've seen is completely the opposite to what we would have expected. Well, I'll offer this from the chair, that this is a new year. It's a new set of people uh, from 18 months ago. And so it's up to us to do something about it in the first instance. And then you have the ultimate uh, remedy, and that is if the board doesn't, doesn't report what we want to hear or doesn't... Um, uh, doesn't meet our performance expectations. That's when we're in a place to be in a position to be able to um, make changes there. Okay. So ultimately, re the responsibility lies here. Are there any more questions? Because then we'll get to debate eventually. 
Okay, right. There being no more questions, I, I understand that there are some people that want to make, <coughs> excuse me, amendments to version two of the letter of expectations. Uh, can can you indicate? Can you, any of you indicate who wants to make of amendments? Right. So I've got Mike, yeah. Yani, and Melanie. and Melanie. All right. And Aaron. Okay. And Aaron. Okay. Um, can we? <coughs> I want to, <coughs> excuse me, I want to go through those amendments or proposed amendments before we get to debate. So, Mike, would you start us, please? Um, yeah, it's actually very minor. It's just the third paragraph. And, um, Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I just wanted to change the word in um, social and economics to social environmental and uh, cultural and economics. So, oh, so, so what? Um, how are we going to be able to do this? Can we put um, coloured amendments yes, on? We can track those changes in the letter. Okay. We can just make it quite clear. I'm, I'm actually happy to do this further and then move the whole lot. Okay. Can we? Can you go through that again, please? So is it in so paragraph I'm one? Just emails through with Joe, but I'm happy. So it's the first paragraph under yeah, prosperous. Yeah, yeah. All right. Are these amendments you what yep, you're it's talking about? Up. It's going yep. up. Okay. okay. So they're in. Uh, just one moment. So I'm going to ask the meeting to consider whether we uh, address each of these amendments individually or that we put all the amendments on the table and adopt them as a whole. Well, if this what one's easily to, easy to address individually. It might be quite a good one just to get through. The other ones, without seeing them, I don't know. I would suggest individually. It's probably going to okay, happen. we're going to we'll do them individually. Sorry, as, as I offered, I was happy to actually put that into the version and then move the whole version so therefore it's on the table. Yep. Yeah, and if, if there's somebody to second that. So. I've moved that. On the whole. So on the whole with that one addition to it. Yep, okay. And that moved Mike yep. Davidson, second to Councillor mm -hmm. Cotter. Is there any, are there any questions? Any debate? Sorry, I can't hear. Yes. Okay. Because then we can do. We can. Motion on the table. So the meeting is in debate. I'm um, using the rules of debate. Um, there is the opportunity for members to speak, speak once, move an amendment, and have a seconder but there's that one opportunity. So now there's a motion on the table. The appropriate way to deal with it would be to go into debate, people to move their further amendments. Point of order, because we understood that we would all get a chance to make several amendments if we had them before we went into debate, which is what James said before. Sorry, the other option that the council could consider is discussion with members who have amendments, um, raising them, and agree to informally put them in an updated version of the letter and then move to debate on that version of the letter. In that instance, um, we, Councillor Davidson has moved and seconded that, um, or Councillor Cotter seconded. You could, with the agreement of the meeting, withdraw that, and the meeting could consider just dis continue discussing this version of the letter with an update, and then in due course, somebody move the letter and then actually debate the points that have been added to it. We still need to do the changes individually. 
But you could you could do more than one vote, can't you? Okay. As the mover, can we just have a look at the amendments and maybe just to include them straight into the. Um, yeah. Can we just have a look at what the amendments, proposed amendments, are going to be? If we're happy with them, we can just include them straight into this motion. So I suggest we just adjourn for a couple of yeah. minutes. Yeah. We will adjourn for, uh, for uh, 10 minutes, actually, while we uh, take some, make a decision here on where we go from here. Okay. Thanks.
and we restart the meeting, the adjourned meeting. Look, thank you for your patience in this matter. There's, it's been quite complicated. Uh, before I go any further, Tim, being on Zoom, did you have a comment? We can't hear you, sorry, at the moment. Did you? <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine at the moment, thank you. Okay, right. Right. What, we've de what I've decided we'll do is we'll resolve where we, our way forward in the next hour and a half. In other words, I'm calling a lunch break now, and when we come back, I expect that we will have a document that we can consider in its entirety, including all of the amendments that uh, various members are wanting to make. Okay, and we'll consider it in one fell swoop from 22-2 onwards. All right, so we're adjourned for lunch. Thank you. See you then. Stream back up, please. Thanks. Right, I'm vacating the chair for the moment. Um, and adjourning item 12. Can you, can you ask Tim? Um, yeah, we've adjourned item 12 until 1 um, 40. 1 40. Sorry, somebody should have asked me before they adjourn the meeting. So, um, you're doing a really good job, though, James. You are doing Very a great good. job, James. Hey, I'm okay. I'm actually, I'm actually enjoying <laughs> observing from a distance. <laughs> Thank you. My coffee's gone cold. We'll okay, can, fresh one. can you let me know you when we're back on them. live stream? Yeah. We are. All good to go. Thank you very much. Look, um, I, I'm resumed the chair so that uh, I can uh, again move the the PX motion. Uh, there was only one item that was um, that was debated really at the last uh, time we, we dealt with this motion. So it was moved um, by myself. It was seconded uh, by Councillor Daniels, um, and uh, and. Uh, so I'll ask that Councillor Daniels again second it. So I will put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. All right, so we're in PX now. We'll clear the room and we'll continue with the other items on the agenda. Um, I promise that this...
and we'll continue item 12 on the agenda. This is the draft letter of expectation from Christchurch City Council to CCHL, the holdings company. Um, over the break, we over the uh, adjournment, we've made some suggested changes to that draft, and they were made by uh, councillors Coker, Keown, and Johansson. And we're going to put them on the screen, and we'll be debating these with the agreement of the mover and seconder, that being Mike uh, Davidson and Pauline Cotter. We would put them in as the letter to be debate under debate. All right. So in the first instance, and and can I just get an indication from you both that, given you know what's being proposed, that you're willing to uh, have these. If, all agree, if agreed by all councillors, uh, or the majority, becomes the letter under debate, so then we can really talk s meaningfully about this. You okay? Yeah, I, I'm happy that the um, amendments that have been put forward from the other councillors are included into the um, substantive now, instead of putting them up as amendments, and I guess... Yeah, and we'll, yeah. we'll talk through them. And the seconder? Fine, thank you. Yeah, yes. Okay, right, so heading through from the uh, top, the amendment is in yellow, it's by Councillor Coker, as you can see, and it's just removal of divestment of. So are you going to ask officers to comment? Oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because like the comment changes are made. Have about made. the changes, you're aware of the changes. Yep. Um, do you have any comments on them? Um, Yes, to remove the opportunity to, to divest um, non-performing companies or where the environment's changed. And um, <coughs> Red Bus would be the one of note where um, they have lost, the, you know, they lost the tenders and therefore the whole reason for Red Bus existing was no longer um, there. And therefore that we shouldn't restrict CCHL from making, um, uh, making a decision or at least having an in inquiry as to whether um, companies should be divested. Okay, so this is not a debate, and it's, it's no, um, more discussion just, just to get us forward. Me for a comment. So, just a comment. That's all. It's yeah, just a and, comment. And, and yes, and from Councillor Coker as the promoter of this, how do you feel about that? About leaving the divestment in? I, I think um, well, it's clear what um, I'm meaning there, and I think I'll leave it to the meeting to decide whether they accept or. Not accept. Uh, Pauline? Staff, um, if the word divestment was removed, that would not prevent CCHL from considering a divestment if they found it necessary. Is that correct? Yes. So it doesn't have to be there? Um, no. I think. What we're wanting, though, is that we realise you have limited resources and the resources should be applied to where you can get the best return. Hence the need to divest in some cases. But you're right, it doesn't stop CCHL themselves from doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Jimmy. Jimmy. What's the difference between the, the term the, uh, divestment and the disposition or process? What's the difference? Between divestment and disposal. And uh, disposal. Po, po, yeah, disposal. Dispo. Uh, None. Same. Mm. Is that a same? One's got more letters. <laughs> okay. Clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just want to know. Any other questions? Uh, Anne Galloway? Thank you, Aaron. <coughs> Just um, whether, we in, whether there is investment or divestment, then um, <coughs> CCHL has to come to us to bring proposals, they can't mm -hmm. just go ahead and do that, is that correct? That's correct. So they have to come and talk with us in order to make a decision? Strategic. Ian, can you talk to that please, just strategic? Um, I guess it depends on um, how major it is. Um, and you know, we've, we've got to remember that CCHL um, executives, staff executives, the chief executive of both, they talk to each other on a regular basis. And um, you know, if there's any proposal that the 
that CCHL is considering around dis divesting or disposing of an asset, you would expect that that conversation would have been had and a determination made as to whether it needs to come to the council to be considered. So just following up, <coughs> if we took the word divestment out, would that mean that they actually couldn't do no, that? No, it wouldn't stop them from no, doing that No, it wouldn't that stop that. No. Okay, thank you. Aaron. So just to check, if we go with this amendment, could that have major financial implications for our group of companies and in turn the council? Only if the board <coughs> made the decision not to divest anything because they felt they couldn't. So no, I don't think so. I think it would largely go on. We're just trying to send a clearer direction on what we are looking for the board to do. Right, okay, cool. Uh, Councillor Scandrit via Zoom. Thank you. Um, I guess one of the questions when we talk about divestment is, and, and Ian mentioned with regards to the scale of it, when we talk about in the original version, there was um, for the greater good of um, Christchurch. So the thing there that was missing was actually its, con its contact with council. And with the terrace example, you know, we, we need to know all the risks, and I don't believe we have those. And with the original letter, the only time that is really mentioned is when it's with climate change. And I think, you know, any major move like that from one of our companies through CCHL has to be discussed with the council because the council's focus is on the greater good for Christchurch, and sometimes the, the companies like CAAL and others are looking at what's best for them in relation to count to the city, and I think there is a difference there, and I think we're still slightly missing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just wondering how we could how we could um, amend that or remedy that, I should say. There is a comment about considering the whole of Christchurch perspective. That's at the bottom of page one. So um, under yeah. the prosperous economy. So we have recognised that sometimes they need to consider the whole of, of Christchurch rather than just. The, um, the company itself. And with, with that, with that I, I totally agree, but the part that's missing for me is when, where were the risks in the risk analysis and we never saw that. And that's, there are risks. I've asked these questions about the specific things which I won't mention in public, and I, I'm still concerned about those. And that's not covered, I don't believe, or, or it should be covered in that last paragraph you've mentioned, Di, with regards to maybe um, just um, a better, a good relationship, good communication with council with regards to the d definition of what's good for Christchurch. Um, look, I don't have the statement of intent in front of me, but um, it's quite a, a lengthy document that covers mm. off um, communications, contact, um, heads up, no surprises, meeting the objectives of the council, all those sort of things. This is just simply a letter of expectations of what is to go into or what the council expects to see in the statement of intent. Um, once we see that, you maybe want, maybe you would like to comment on, on the contents of the statement. Perhaps it's better that I talk offline with you, Ian, to, to kind, of, kind of establish what I'm really concerned about. Happy to do that. Okay. Thank you, James. I think it's also um, important to understand that this is this a step in the process is the letter of expectation. It's not, it's not the end end game. It's the opening gambit. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other comments or questions about this amendment? Uh, Phil. Yes. Right. I I I feel that it, I'm, my view is it should stay in because we don't want to tie these guys up to that they're scared to make a decision. We, we we're giving them the licence to invest in things, and if they if they've got a, a something that's a fizzer in front of them, they should be able to just say, oh, "We don't want this. We're out of here." Instead of having to run back to us all the time. But that's just my view. Through you, Mr. Chair, we have heard that answer that this does not stop them from doing that. Taking that word out does not yeah, stop them from doing that. Some people that. take what's written as the as the real thing, but anyway. Good governance. Okay, so this is a proposed amendment, um, and is there any any uh, opposite? You don't need to. We'll put it in one go. Yeah. Okay. We'll go to the uh, and see the 
in the next uh, paragraph down, the original, no, sorry, just go back up. The original motion is there, and that's the edit, but we'll get Councillor Davidson to talk about that when we, uh, when we put the motion, all right? And he'll discuss it in debate. Right, next to the next one, please, the next amendment. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, carry on. Yanni? I just wanted to raise the concern with this particular section, and um, I'm very supportive of this amendment. Uh, I'm concerning, concerned that the context of the wording around here really focuses on value for money and efficiency rather than some of the other social, cultural and environmental outcomes that we should be believing in. And I know someone's given the example of Red Bus. I don't know how many councillors were here when we had a public deputation to a long-term plan or an annual plan that talked about why Red Bus was such a good bus operator in terms of um, the way the buses were operated. So sometimes... Things may not make a lot of money, but they provide a community benefit that's important to our city. If strategically, for example, we wanted to have a public transport um, operation in the city, then you know we've really lost that opportunity by what we've done, in my view. So I think decisions like that should be coming to the full council, and I would be very supportive of including divestment um, being deleted from this section, especially because of the context for the other things that's in here. Right. Any other comments, questions? This is what I was thinking that they, those decisions do come to council, like Red Bus came to council. Yeah. So, yeah. I will add from the chair too, though, that uh, the primary issue with Red Bus was that they didn't get the contracts, so they they weren't giving getting going to get revenue. The key important thing to repeat: Councillor Cotter has just said. There are rules in which what comes to council and what doesn't, and major decisions of strategic importance do come, and you decide. Red bus came to this council. All I'm wanting to do is um, to get both a report and a briefing that explains um, what's in the report so we can have a discussion. Any questions about that? Thank you. Right, to the next um, amendment in the next paragraph. Councillor Coker again. We can see it, how they complement the balance of the board. Could you just describe a little bit about that? Um, the reason for this is just so that the councillors can have... Um, a deeper understanding of when CCHL um, recommends appointees to boards. Um, yeah, that's Any basically comment? it. So it's to see um, if we if there's a board um, and they are looking for a new appointee, um, what the makeup of that board is and what skills and diversity and all those things that those people <coughs> have and where the gaps are and how um, a proposed appointee fills those gaps. Okay. Any comment from staff on this? Not necessary. Okay, oh, no, any comment from no, council? No. Sorry. Um, my comment is I, I have no issue that I think it's a, a good amendment. Okay. S uh, councillors, members? Anne? Just wondering if we just scroll back down. Does, is, is this already covered in the, in the process and the, in the pre um, presented from you on the process you conduct to appoint members to boards? Isn't that the sort of thing that would be involved in that? Do you no. I thought it was appropriate to put um, that amendment because I believe the first paragraph is a general process rather than um, the second paragraph being more specific about particular <coughs> board appointments. Compliment. Yeah. Okay. Clear? Any other comments on this amendment? No? Right, to the next one, uh, and we'll, get, we'll carry on with Councillor Coker's amendments. I've gone too far. That's the yellow one here. No, we'll go to the yellow one first. And uh, can you comment on that for us to start off with, Melanie? Um, the purpose of this was just uh, to make the sentence more clear um, because the way that I could originally interpret it is that people, uh, that employees or um, yeah, could be given bonuses um, and I'd rather 
that we weren't giving bonuses based on performance, but rather um, decreasing people's remuneration if they're not doing a good job. Which is the risk-based yeah. component you're talking about. Okay, any comment from staff? Firstly, okay, councillors, any issues with this as an amendment? Anne? Just, just one, wondering if you could just clarify a little bit more what you mean by this. I'm not really sure. Could I ask staff to comment on it? Because it was Diane who gave the right. audio me to. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Diane, please. Mm. I suggested that because Council Coker was concerned that bonuses were only add-on bonuses. And I did point out that in a lot of circumstances, a person's remuneration has a risk-based component to it, so that they have a salary, but a big a chunk of that is at risk. So if they're not performing, it is at risk. Um, and so it was addressing Council Coker's mm. concern, I thought adding that might make it clearer uh, and address her concern about bonuses always being on top rather than um, holding people to account for performing. Comfortable with that? Yeah. I'm just a bit worried that it's linked to performance and how, you know, that's the worry. Is, do you see that being a risk it's in itself? <coughs> Performance-based pay, sort of. It's not performance-based pay. Well, hopefully it means that they, um, they will perform. Uh, I wasn't against the idea of remuneration being linked to performance as such, but more that people could get additional bonuses and pay greater amounts um, if their performance is deemed to be good. Um, and we're wanting, obviously, good performance, but we want to know the cap on people's pay, I suppose, is what the purpose of this is. In this case, there's been some wording removed that actually could have been misinterpreted as bonuses, so this tidies it up. I think it, it, it's a bit more, uh, it clarifies it that the, with the risk-based um, wording in there. Yanni, you have a yeah, question, just comment? Just going to ask, would, would this mean like, you know, um, COVID-19 hits, we lose a lot of uh, income from our companies, so their performance is way down, that the CIO salaries get reduced to, in line with that? Why would you do that? I don't think we can comment on that. It's not within that. It's not that problem. No. It, would it I, would it not depend on what the arrangements are? This is remember this is within the commercial company within the uh, companies, and it'll be um, prescriptive as to what the uh, component um, remuneration. Well, I guess aspect is. the flip side is say we get a major earthquake and suddenly we get all this stuff coming in through the port, and their volumes are going up. Does that mean that they get the rewards? Well, well, I, 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 I my mean, answer to that is that place. it's written in black and white for them, and that's how they operate. Okay. And that's the way it should should be. Let's be fair. It's contractual. Yeah. Aaron. Yeah, I think the key word there that um, Melanie's left in is performance. So. Those are external issues that is not part of the person's performance. They're an influence on the organisation, but not their actual performance. So when there's a review of their performance at the year, and at DHB it's called at risk, um, so there's a percentage of the CE salary for, for the, my last nine years there it was, that we had, um, they had a salary and they get all of the salary if the board agrees that the at risk portion is paid. So that's, that's how it was done there. So it's, it's not strange to this town. OK, any other questions? Right. Are there any more amendments below that? that I can't see the whole thing. All right, then we go back to uh, the one in green, which is Councillor Kewen. And could you just speak to this amendment to start us? Yeah, so it was just adding into, we've often said for years about the restraint referring to the top end, but I mean the, the top end salaries are operating in uh, a, a, a field where lots of people have paid those sort of salaries, but the real issue is more, it's not about the top end so much, it's the bottom end and the gap between the two. So this is just to say to them, hey look, if, you, if you're moving salaries, 
don't be moving the top end because 3% of $500,000 is a lot different to 3% of $20,000 in actual dollar terms. So it's, it's about addressing the gap. So that when you do only percentages, the gap grows. And uh, so it's about addressing that because, you know, um, like someone told me last week, um, plumbers and uh, drain layers save more lives than doctors every year globally. So okay. work that out. So you've put it on the table to be uh, added to the letter of expectation. Can we just get any comment from the staff, if any? I only made the comment before that um, there's a bit of disjunct between um, expecting CCHL to exercise restraint in the level of senior executives and narrowing the gap between the highest and the lowest remuneration because it's not just um, the higher level which we were talking about in that first sentence. Um, the second point that um, Councillor Kewan is making covers the whole um, gamut of the CCHL family. That's fine. It, it, it's his view, well, it, the view of the council is that it could be best demonstrated. Um, there may be a response from CCHL to that. Okay. All right. Any other comments around the, from the <coughs> members? No? Okay. Right, those are the amendments to the letter. There's an additional resolution has been proposed by Councillor Johansson, and now we see it here in the green, number two there, because uh, number one is, we're, we'll be looking at this updated version as we've just discussed. Uh, number two here, this is an additional resolution. So I'll give you a moment to have a look at that, and then I'll ask Councillor Johansson to speak to it. Oh. oh, I'm happy to second it. Oh, hang on, hang on. We're, we're, no, we're, we're, we're adding, we're, we're adding this to it, to the, the whole thing. You'll have a chance shortly. Um, so, do you want to speak to it, Yanni? Um, I've got you, Tim. Yeah, I mean, as as councillors um, may be aware, we, we we have in 2016 asked for a governance manual of how we give direction to our companies and how we work with them, recognising the shortfalls. That was 2016, the start of 2016. So it's nearly five years later and we still don't have it. But in the meantime, the government, as I understand it, have changed the legislation um, and they now enable us to do what they call a statement of expectation. And I was really taken when I read the Auckland Council review into CCOs around the use of that versus the letter of expectation. And what was quite clear from that report was that letters of expectation are often um, too vague, uh, that they don't um, really address the strategic issues, and that there's a better mechanism, which is called a statement of expectation. So I'm suggesting rather than have a big debate today about all the different issues, um, which I, I would have preferred, but we're pretty sure on time, um, that we look at that new mechanism to address things like, and this is um, according to the legislation or, or, or and the Auckland Review, how the CC, how CCHL could conduct relations with the governing body and community boards, uh, Māori entities and the public, um, the council's expectation of CCHL and individual CCOs, uh, and generally, um, the extent to which the council and I think this is really critical, to which the Council expects CCHL to consult it when developing significant plans or strategies with its companies. Um, and the final one is the Council's expectations about Chief Executive Salaries and Tenure. Um, and I, I just see that the world has moved on and we can be a lot more prescriptive, um, but we need to get the advice on what's possible. And so looking at the statement of expectation with some more detail and advice on February when we're doing the governance manual makes sense and it may have a bit of overlap with the letter of expectation but I think we should be open to it especially because of what we've heard this morning but also because of some of the <coughs> fundamental problems we've had with getting um, issues like remuneration addressed in the past. Thank you. Uh, I'll say from the chair and as the chair thank you for uh, using this method of uh, progressing your, your co-papa. Okay, so um, firstly, any comment from staff? I'll come um, to you in a minute, Tim. We, um, 
We discussed this this morning, we touched on it um, earlier on, um, and yes, there is the, the new provision in the Act for a statement of um, expectations, and we're quite happy to engage in the conversation around how that might fit in. It's, it's not a mandatory um, requirement in the Act. Um, the Council may elect to um, issue a statement of expectations, so let's explore that and, and get detail around it. And and just, yeah. Thank you, uh, Chair. And to follow up from Ian, I think it's important that the report describes exactly what is in the Auckland report and what the similarities to what the situation in Christchurch is and what the differences are so that you understand what you're making your decisions on and that's fully and clearly explained in the report to Finance and Performance Committee in February. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Tim Scandred on Zoom now. Uh, thank you, James. I'll, I'll withdraw my question because I really do need to do some homework on the difference between the statement of expectation and letter of expectation, but thank you very much. Be here on the 25th of February. And you'll get, and you'll okay. get the answer. Any questions or any comments around the, uh, from the members? Mike? Just... just one thing, and I, I guess it's for Councillor Johansson. Like I'm happy, and uh, it's up to Pauline as well to actually have this included straight away into the substantive, and there does not need it to be moved as an amendment. Okay. Any other comment? I, I was quite keen for it to be separate because I, I have a, you know, in my view, this is a better process to get some of the things we want in terms of the letters expectation. So, I. But as you said, time is. Is important oh, yeah, to as us, long as it's two separate resolutions, I'm happy for it just oh, to be incorporated the into the. Yeah, it's the in the, so yeah, yeah, I'm, cool. I'm now going to ask the mover and seconder that whether you're uh, you agree to having that second part and those amendments in your motion. Aye. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so now I open the meeting to debate. That is what we're debating above us, so that we're clear. The updated version with all those colours is what we're debating. So I open the debate. Oh, that, the debate's closed. <laughs> OK, uh, Anne. Um, so I believe in transparency, and I believe that we are working towards becoming more transparent in our decision-making. I believe in uh, community involvement in decision-making, and I believe we're also moving well um, into a much stronger position. But I also believe that we must build strong and respectful relationships with our partners and our, our family, our council family. As a council family, we need to be able to have opportunities to work things out privately, as in any family, um, before we go out um, to the public with um, decisions and to give them the opportunity to feed back to our decision making. So this is fundamentally, I think, about trust. And um, for example, C CCHL, the phrase in here, in the LOE is, CCHL should uh, make such trade-offs as it considers appropriate from a, ho a whole of Christchurch perspective. That statement indicates to me a level of trust that we're putting in them, that CCHL has the right people in place to deliver in a way that is appropriate, and this is also from the LOE, appropriate from a whole of Christchurch perspective. So we are indicating through this that we want CCHL to address climate change, develop stronger planning and reporting frameworks to address this, to address diversity in appointments, to exercise restraint and remuneration, and to take into account the public service um, nature of this role that they have we want them to implement the living wage. And that seems to me, it seems to me that they are really key and important things. It seems that we are running a risk that as council, we want to micromanage our council owned organisations. And I think that this could have the effect of reducing the mana of uh, our CCHL. And I think the LOE is a high-level strategic document 
The details need to be addressed in the SOIs, which are still to be determined. And I look forward to an opportunity to work with CCHL and to nut out those SOIs so that we all achieve what we hope for um, through, through um, working together. I will be supporting what I, what's in front of us today. Um, I wasn't quite ready to speak, I haven't thought of anything uh, that much, but I, I just wanted to say really briefly that I think this is great that for the first time in, um, I don't know how long, because I've only been here a year and a half, but for the first time in a very long time I suspect that this has um, been a, a process that we've, we've done openly and, and with the public. Um, and you know, as, as their representatives, it's not good enough for us to abdicate our responsibility to, um, to ensure that the, the company, uh, all, all our companies are um, uh, uh, g delivering on their values. And, and I believe that the people of Christchurch do want to see stronger action on, on climate change. They do want a living wage um, implemented and they, they, and they want um, salary restraint at the top as well. Um, I don't think this, this letter um, necessarily ticks all those boxes, but it's been a really good exercise in, um, in transparency today. Kia ora. thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Chen. Thank you, yeah. Um, I think today is quite significant because we have, uh, you know, this uh, kind of uh, discussion, uh, Q&A, and also debate under the circumstances open and tra transparent, because all those are you know? all those people, community, they are all repair, they are concerned, you know? the, the uh, council money, particularly uh, for the, uh, those uh, value for money. Uh, so they are uh, eligible you know, to fully understand all the, all the, the uh, uh, policies regarding to this uh, the issue. Particularly, these are uh, the Later expectation, we are all aware this uh, high-level strategic document is we give the proper you know, the, uh, strategic direction to all the uh, council control on the, uh, the kind of trading company or the organization through the uh, CCHL. So our strategic uh, those, uh, direction should be more kind of strategic view and also need to fully comply with the council's uh, strategic priority as well as our uh, kind of community outcome. That's the, the, the kind of high uh, priority. I'm so happy, you know, regarding to this uh, draft one, at least, you know, generally we fully comply with this uh, direction. The other one is absolutely not any uh, kind of document is perfect, it's impossible. So that's why uh, you know, the council, we consist of management uh, the one and also the governance one. We're working together to make this uh, city, the community more better today, better than yesterday, tomorrow better than today, future better than tomorrow. That's very, very the culture, very, very important. Generally speaking, I'm very happy because while this uh, strategic document consists of five uh, category, prosperous economy, a moment that's very important. We are all aware we are under the specific circumstances of COVID-19, still under the, this, this kind of the, 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 the bigger the impact, you know. How do we to overcome the loss of recovery? We need to uh, work in together. Council, you know, all the strategic, uh, all those the, the partnership, as well as wider the, the community, you know, people. We all working together to make it happen. The other one to how to vitalize our economy, you know, to take more kind of uh, cost effective, whether for money, the, uh, this kind of. Uh, and uh, the other one is a uh, uh, particular. Uh, the uh, the governance role. There's also council uh, expectation because all down. Okay, but so briefly, okay, because what diversity we always mention in, important, but but why is real generally diversity? We review the current the the council trading company actually still not yet achieve all the expectation. I hope in this generally the uh, uh, diversity. So this uh, direction, you know, this uh, pretty good. So I fully support this. Kia ora, Councillor Chen. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, too long. Kate Defy. 
Uh, Councillor Coker. Um, this letter of expectations is a high-level strategic document which we've talked about. Um, and um, it's to our company, to CCHL, and we need to, well, as we were told the other day, our companies have been formed to keep um, our politicians basically at arm's length. Now, there's a good reason for that because they're commercial activities. However, CCHL is 100% owned by council and by the people of Christchurch, and this should always be front of mind. And so what we say in this letter, I hope, is is followed through with the statement of intent that CCHL write back to us and that they follow through on what they say. And I really look forward to seeing that and I really hope that um, the level of trust that um, Councillor um, Galloway talked about can be strengthened because at the moment there is a little bit of distrust here. And so if we can work together and they can listen to us and we can listen to them, I think that would be good for the whole city. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, Councillor Cotter. Thank you. Um, look, I agree with most of what's been said, and I think we've, this is sort of pitched in the right area yeah. now. Um, the original document, we felt proud of ourselves because we had strengthened the governance and climate change sections of that. Um, but today we've gone even further and we've strengthened their expectation around remuneration levels, and we've grown that out from just exercising restraint um, to actually narrowing the gap, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we've got that in now. Um, but actually, this is very much about good relationships and building trust, and, and I, I don't agree with Councillor Coker. I think that the relationship's working very well, and this document outlines very clearly um, what we expect. But yeah, we are continually improving those relationships and our collaboration, but whenever we've requested the Chief Executive or any staff to attend our meetings, that's happened every time, and we've held many workshops with CCHL, and this letter of expectation outlines our wish to continue those so that we can ensure effective and aligned approach to our joint work streams. Um, look, uh, regarding um, Yanni's amendment, uh, resolution or motion there, um, I really support receiving the report on the governance manual, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll workshop that as well prior, um, and, and we'll be considering the pros and cons and appropriateness or not of using a statement of expectation in the future. And up to that point, I've got an open mind on this until we've done the work on that. But I really look forward to doing that work. And I'm also looking forward to the statement of intent coming back. But um, we're going forward with this. We are building, continually building good relationships with CCHL. And I'd like to thank our chief executive there too for the great work that you're doing there and our staff working together. And thanks staff for the continued work on this. You've probably been pulling your hair out, but I feel that we've got it to a good place today. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Major. Yep. I, well, the only thing I worry about is that we, we, we trust these guys. They'll, they'll do what we want. We just don't want to put the pressure on them so much that we, we remove their agility to do things um, that they do best. We, we, they, they know how to run their business and that. They don't need us to... Come, but I know we've got to have a, uh, an overarching lens on them, but I, it just worries me that we might be trying to cramp their style too much. That's the only thing I'm a bit worried about. Other than that, it's all right. Short and pithy. Um, any other councillors? Councillor Johansson. Thank you. Um, so to start off with, I just wanted to raise... Um, a few concerns about the letter of expectation. I appreciate some of the changes that have been made, but to me it still doesn't go far enough. It's not specific enough uh, in the right places, and it still leaves open a huge room for interpretation. Um, I just want to start off with the Auckland Council um, review and appreciate that that's different. They are a different environment, but the principles of that review that have been identified I think are actually pretty sound. And just to quote you from that review, too much has been made of the notion that CCOs are commercial entities. They are not. Some of their activities are commercial in nature and they must often exercise commercial judgment and business expertise, but at heart they are community-owned entities that exist to provide services to those who partly or wholly fund them, Aucklanders. 
As a result, they must be more conscious of the community expectations and appropriately balance commercial and public interests. It then goes on to say that there's um, significant improvements that can be made around how they get strategic direction. And that's really about being much more focused through a statement of the expectation to be very clear about things like the remuneration uh, policies, to be really clear about the opportunity for the community to be consulted with in terms of significant strategic direction. There's a lot of other things in here, but at essence, the key concern I have is that for the last few years we've been putting in similar resolutions around remuneration and we have simply not seen the restraint that is anywhere near the reality of what the ordinary person in our city goes through. We have seen some of our chief executives on close to a million dollars and within a, within a short space of time their salaries have just about doubled or increased by a third to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't think it's acceptable that for, over ne for nearly 10 years we've been trying to get a living wage which was started by the cleaners from the airport coming into uh, this chamber asking to be paid a living wage so that they could support their family, that they still don't have a living wage and we're told that there's no money and it's not affordable and yet we've seen the chief executive's salary from the airport alone go up um, from 2016 from $650,000 a year to 2018 to $836,000 in the same time. You can't tell me there's not enough money to pay people a living wage in our city through our council companies. And despite the words that we've put in time and time again, we have not seen that happen. So we need to be much more directive. Finally, I'd just say, I cannot accept a letter of expectation that fails to mention a significant issue such as the terrorist airport. The community deserve to know what our direction is to our holding company and to our companies about a significant development such as that. And I'm really disappointed that we do not have anything in there that expresses a view. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Scandrett, are you standing by? Uh, thank you, James. Um, I guess for me, the, the letter of expectation is it's such an important document with regards to the directors on companies have a, a um, first and foremost, their obligation is to the company. And the companies have an obligation to do what's best for Christchurch. Through CCHL, we, we hope that they do this. But we need that contact. I think we need better contact, and that's been really um, highlighted, I think, with the tariff discussion. But when we get these, and they are sales pitches, we need a 360 degree look at the proposals that are coming up for what is best for Christchurch. Because as councillors, our sole purpose is what is best for Christchurch. And I believe that there are differences there. And that cannot happen. And I think that through the letter of expectation, we must make sure that that is clear, that we need that good expectation. We need the sales pitch, but the realistic outcomes that could um, happen with those side issues. And I, that's been missing for me in the, in the uh, briefings that we've had. And I hope that this document and in the future will lay that out very clearly. Thank you. Thank you that. Councillor Kewen. Do you wish to make a comment? Oh, that's what, it's pretty much all been said, and I got my little one-liner in there about closing the gap, so good on me. <laughs> Kia ora. Before I go to the mover of the, uh, of the motion, um, just from the chair, I, I, I want to underline the fact that we are progressing the process of dealing with our company, CCHL, by the governance manual discussion that we're going to be having on the 25th of February. And that's really important, an important output from uh, today's debate and discussion. So I'm pleased about that. And, and I appreciate that, Councillor Johansson, given your passion for the COPAPA that you fully and, and, uh, and believe in, um, that you were willing to uh, leave it at that and we'll work on it in the near future. Um, so I also want to um, thank the staff for all the work that they've done to date for this. Uh, much appreciated and particularly the work that was done today because we had to do a few amendments and to that I'll add uh, my thanks to 
uh, my colleagues here as members uh, for being able to um, negotiate and, and uh, add those amendments to the original motion. So with that I say thank you very much and I'm supporting this motion as it sits on the table. And to the mover, who has the last word? Eight minutes, wasn't it? No. no. Oh, nine. Not eight minutes. Uh, but, and oh, I will note that you could have had eight minutes, but you were uh, generous I I was enough to, the end. To, to just have the three at the end. I'd like to thank you, James, for your cheering, actually. It's been excellent. Um, and also my colleagues, I think this has been a good discussion. We have ended up at quite a good point. Um, but obviously I think we need to improve the process to get to this this point and I think it can even get better as we move move forward. Uh, I think you know there's a few decisions we make during the term that really affect I guess the direction of, of the city um, and the letter of expectation is one of those decisions so it's actually a really important piece of work that we, we do and we need to make sure that we do it correctly um, and, and actually indicate what we want our companies to do through the through the holding company. Um, so it is actually good to have this in a public setting, this, this debate. Because um, we, all, we all want our companies to be successful, and we need them to be successful. Um, but success should not be measured just by the size of a dividend. Um, I believe our companies need to deliver a public good socially, environmentally, culturally and economically. Um, and one of the things I do not think it's important, we should not be micromanaging our companies. Um, that's, but what we need to do is ensure that you know CCHL, our holding company, is travelling the same pathway that we're travelling, and that is what the letter of expectation does, and that is why it's extremely in, important. And there's opportunities throughout the term, throughout the year, to, where we have <laughs> formal reviews, and we need to use them them wisely. Um, I'm happily support where where we're at. I, I believe we can do better. It's a big step up from where we've been, and I think it's good having this public public debate. So. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. And I just hope that if uh, the holdings company is travelling in the same direction as us, uh, travelling at least in an EV or possibly on bikes. So with that, I will put the motion. All those in favour, and the motion is as we see it above me. I beg your pardon? Oh, one and then two. Yes. Um, so for number one, uh, I put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Would you like that noted? Um, yeah. Councillor Johansson opposed. And Councillor And, and Councillor Scandrit, were you opposed? Or yes. Is that for yes? It. yes. You aye. Want? Okay, aye, right. Okay, um, thank you. I'll put the second part of the... Um, of this uh, motion. Number two there. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those opposed? I declare the uh, motion carried unanimously. With that, that is our business for today. Thank you, staff. Thank you, ball boys and linesmen. And um, thank you to Paul, uh, Councillor Cotter, who threw me under the bus with five minutes notice to be chairing this meeting. And to thank you to all my colleagues, as I say, members for today. So I'll finish the uh, meeting with a karakia whakamutunga, and that is te tapu o tato kōrero. That is our talk is finished. And we bring the mana back to the uh, whare by saying, ka whakahokia ki te whare. Kia ora tato.